went after rolling real well and um you know, Armando doesn't pair too well with that intentional walk thing. He likes to go after the hitter who's up there and he's a closer, he gets anyone out, you know. All right, more on Mike Piazza. The big bomb last night. He is off to some start. No question about it. And he is simply locked in at the plate, receiving the high fives and the congratulations as he crosses the plate. Through 58 games, the average at 364, 19 homers, 16 doubles. And yes, even three stolen bases, only striking out 26 times. All those positive numbers, career highs at this time. Piazza likes what he's doing. What's really been working is I have just haven't been thinking about it at all. I've just been going up and uh, swinging the bat relaxed and, and free and, and trying to clear my mind and uh, just see the ball hit it. I mean, it's uh, keeping things very simple. So uh, it's been working so far. I don't plan on changing it. And, um, you know, and then the key is as well is the fact that I feel like that we've been very balanced offensively. So I'm not putting any extra burden on my uh, on myself to produce. And uh, and that's why I've been swinging the bat pretty well. So with the loss, we check out the Geico National League East standings. The Mets fall to four and a half games behind Atlanta. The Braves a winner over the Cubs last night. The Mets check in with a 37 and 30 mark. The Phils 12 games below 500, but they are five and five in their last 10. Hoping that the rain holds off until after the conclusion of tonight's game between the Mets and Phils here at Shea on Fox Sports Net. Hi again, everyone. I'm Matt Laughlin. Thanks for Wednesday night baseball action. Second of three here at Shea between the Mets and the Phils. And as the Mets came to the ballpark this afternoon, they received a dose of bad news. Ray Ordonez on the disabled list since the end of May with a broken bone in his left arm. Had hoped to return to the team sometime after the All-Star break. But now he'll be lost for the rest of the season as the bone is not healing properly. We'll have more on this in just a little bit. But right now, let's get the take on the long-term loss of Ray Ordonez from Howie and Fran. Well, certainly, I think, Matty, it puts a little bit of a crimp in what the Mets might want to do in terms of looking at players from outside the organization for other positions if they prioritize at shortstop. Steve Phillips right now, however, Fran, says he's not obsessed with finding a new shortstop. I don't think he has to be. I think Melvin Mora and Kurt Abbott are both capable shortstops and will add some punch to the offense. So I don't think you have to panic and go out and go after shortstop, although it's unfortunate they lost Ray Ordonez for the year. Remember, though, the trade deadline is not until July 31st, so the Mets do have a little bit more than a month to make further assessments. Now, what they'll have to do tonight is get another performance from Al Leiter, much like they've gotten all year. He's been that good, and just about every time he's pitched, the Mets have won. Following this play in Los Angeles, an acrobatic move as he slaps the tag on, but suffers a break and was placed on the DL. The Mets were hopeful that he would return sometime after the All-Star break, but all changed after an examination today. Uh, Ray was examined today, and, and uh, as, as, as was the practice of the follow-up exam, and uh, they did not like the way the fracture was healing. Uh, he's developed an angulation, a little bit of a bending in the healing process between the two bones. Uh, to a degree that they're not satisfied with. So they're going to have to go in and, and perform surgery, put a plate and screws in, the, in his forearm and, and allow it to heal, and we've lost him for the year. Was there anything that could have been done differently medically to prevent this from happening? No, it's, you know, it's, they were actually more conservative than they no, might normally be, and, and with the splint that they put on, uh, completely immobilizing his arm. And uh, it's just something that in the healing process, 95% uh, of the time it heals without a problem, and, and Ray was part of that 5%. You were prepared to have him back. Now you don't have him for the rest of the season. How does this alter your thoughts about what you may have to do with this team? Well, it, it doesn't really alter it in the short term. I think that uh, between Kurt Abbott and Melvin, we've, we've adequately uh, filled in at shortstop and, and uh, done a pretty decent job. So we'll continue to look and see if there's something that would in, improve us in a significant way. But short of that, I think we'll go with these guys and, and let them keep doing the job for us. Well, it's kind of interesting. You know, my leg bent like that when it was in a cast, and I have an 18-degree uh, bend on my leg, and uh, his is 15 degrees and I'm glad they're making the decision to go back in there and uh, uh, straighten it you know that that's necessary for play so you know we're all with Ray and uh, I'm sure the next time he'll he'll heal fine and the lineup Fran against Al Leiter 
And for the Phillies, it'll be Doug Glanville leading off. He'll be followed by Ron Gant and then Scott Rowland. Mike Lieberthal, game-winning hit last night, hit a bullet in the center field off Armando Benitez, and he is starting to get hot. We talked about him in the open last night, and he is a force to be reckoned with with these Phillies. He'll be followed by Jordan Burrell, and the rest of the lineup reads like Hunter, Arias, and Schiller. Al Leiter, 8-1 on the year. The Mets, 12-1. When Leiter has been on the mound, the only loss coming in Los Angeles mm. at the end of May. But Leiter, fifth in the National League with that earned run average of exactly three. Is it his best start ever, Fran? He was pretty good two years ago, too. Boy, I'll tell you, he has been outstanding this season, and he loves the month of June. He's been very, he has a great winning percentage in the month of June. It's the inside corner with his cut fastball to Doug Glanville leading things off. Glanville had a big hit last night. Led off the 10th inning with a double off of Armando Benitez. Came around to score the winning run. Fastball away, a ball and a strike. Doug Glanville has hit lighter well in the past with 9 out of 23 against him. Glanville, great speed. But he swings through the change. It's 1 and 2. These planes overhead have not seemed to bother Glanville too much. At least not at Shea Stadium. He has always hit well in this ballpark. And you'll see plenty of them overhead here at Shea. Glanville, familiar with the area. Living in Teaneck, New Jersey now. Born in Hackensack, right around the Meadowlands. He grew up a Phillies fan. Started his career in Chicago with the Cubs and the Phillies. Lifted foul down the right field line. He was a much more effective leadoff hitter last year for the Phillies. Doesn't walk very often. Hit over 300. Gets a lot of base hits. And he can steal a base. Very good defensive center fielder also. Graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. And the one two on the way. Got him. So Al Leiter strikes out Doug Glanville to get us started. One away. Let's go around the horn, take a look at the Mets defensively. At first base, Todd Zeal. Ricardo Alfonso is at second. And with Ordonia's down for the year, well, first Robin Ventura at third, and then over to shortstop where Melvin Mora will play tonight. It was Abbott last night. So here's Ron Gant now. Went 0 for 4 in last night's game. Fastball on the inside corner. In the outfield, Jason Tyner gets the start in left. Jay Payton is in center. And Derek Bell in right field. Fastball hitter at the plate. He likes hard stuff. Likes the ball from the middle of the plate in. He's very strong. You see Mike Piazza doing the catching. All in one again. And another fastball. It's nothing in two. Likes hard stuff in. But not that hard. Not that far in. with 11 home runs. Has a lot of power. He was a guy the Phillies felt they would trade him before this year is out. I guess that one. Fouled straight back. Still nothing in two. One of the things you have to factor in is take a look at one of those baseballs that's come under so much scrutiny being held right now by Red Reed. Wait a minute. Now they're, they're giving those baseballs a clean bill of health. Well, not exactly. Well, not 1998, exactly 99 of this year. They say it may be a little livelier than in the past. They're not sure. <laughs> a little bit. Nothing in two to get. And again, a fastball. What was that great line about George Foster when he hit 50 home runs? Somebody said, check his bat. Johnny Finch said, check his muscle. Rick Reed will pitch against his former team, the Pirates, on Saturday here at Shea. Pirates come in Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right here, one and two on Ron Gant. And it's looped into short right field. So Gant will hold on at first base as Bell plays it back in. One out single for Ron Gant. He'll bring up Scott Rowland. 
the third baseman, number 17, Scott and Last Wolf. night's ballgame, especially late in the game, a lot of talk about what a manager could do like Bobby Valentine, Scott Rowland batted with a runner on second base, first base open, and Bobby elected to pitch to him. And they got him, and he just got rolling. No, they didn't get Lieberthal, but Bobby's reasoning was interesting. He said, Armando Benitez is not comfortable throwing intentional walks. Now, you would know better than me having caught some of these guys, not, of course, the current day pitchers. To me, that sounds awfully strange. Yeah, well, some guys are not. And, you know, it's like a pitch out there. They're not comfortable throwing pitch outs. But Bobby Valentine felt in his heart that was the right decision, and Benitez wasn't comfortable doing it. And he was second guessed for it. It just seems to me that, as crazy as it might sound at face value, the intentional walk becomes an, an integral part of strategy late in games when your closer's on the mound. Somehow you got to get him comfortable yeah. with the concept. Give him the option. But give him the option. Also, I mean, I'm sure you'd rather pitch to Jordan. They elected to go with Lieberthal. Benitez has real good stuff. One of the most dominating pitchers coming out of the bullpen in all of baseball should be able to get a guy like Lieberthal. Lieberthal beat him. So Bobby Valentine made the pipe. The 1-0 to Roland. Inside ball two. One thing about this game, it's a great game to second guess. It's been part of the game for many, many years. I think that first guess is the toughest thing. Most of the time that falls in the manager's lap. Three balls, no strikes to roll in them. I think the interesting part of it, though, is not so much second-guessing the strategy now that Bobby's told us why he didn't do it. It's how do you get a pitcher comfortable throwing four balls out of the strike zone when you may need him to get mm. an inferior hitter yeah. and get out of an inning. I'd never you, heard you know, that you before. You know how you do it? You work on it. Well, Leiter just threw four out of the strike zone, but he wasn't trying. So add a gray hair as Mike Lieberthal will bat with runners at first and second. He did the Mike Mets Lieberthal. and Benitez in in the 10th inning last night. We'll go back to last night. Page six. It was a pitch up in the strike zone. Lieberthal hit a line drive in the center field. That was after Glanville scoring the what eventually was the winning run. This was after Bobby Valentine elected to pitch to Scott Rowland. And they got Scott Rowland and Lieberthal got the Mets. on the inside corner to Lieberthal. Some pitchers struggle early in ball games. They say you got to get them late. Well, Leiter's different. Now it's had a lot of early success. Interesting that Fred Hina, the trainer, would be a guy that Bobby's consulting early on. Don't know if that's got anything to do with Al Leiter as Lieberthal. Out in front, pulls it foul, nothing in two. Alvin Dark was a great player here in New York for the Giants and a very good manager for many years of different teams. Used to talk to the trainer before every game, find out how the players were doing, and I'm sure Bobby does the same thing. And he would tell the trainer, do me a favor, he said, keep the, the middle of my defense healthy. Catcher, second base, shortstop, center field. And let the other guys do it now. He said, I can handle the rest of this. But it was funny, he always felt he wanted up the middle healthy. Ventura, two out fronts, a wide throw. Back to first, they double up Lieberthal anyway. For the second straight game, Lieberthal is grounded into a first inning double play. Ventura started it last night. He starts it again tonight. No runs, a hit a walk in one left. He handled the big hop. Phillies don't last of the first inning. Phillies did not score. Here's the New York Mets batting order that Kirk Schilling will face. You see Melvin Moore leading off for the Mets. He'll be followed by Derek Bell and then Edgardo Alfonso. You got Mike Piazza, Robin Ventura, and Todd Zeal with that nine-game hitting streak. Peyton, Tyner, and Leiter to follow Zeal. And so Kurt Schilling, who's 10 and 5 lifetime against the Mets, gets set to go to work for the 10th time this year. A year that began rehabbing from shoulder surgery that Schilling underwent last December. And the numbers this year are certainly not anywhere the way you'd expect them to be for Kurt Schilling. However, his last start was a real good one, and they feel he's on the track now. Biggest thing is his fastball. He throws an awful lot of foreseen fastballs. He can be overpowered. <laughs> Nothing in one to more. You saw that nightmare at Shea Stadium last May 23rd. Remember Schilling had a 4-0 lead going to the ninth inning. 
And the Mets scored five in the ninth. Schilling pitched the entire game. I thought it was a great outing by Schilling. They wanted to take Schilling out of the ball game. He didn't want to come out. He stayed in. He absorbed the loss. But what did he prove himself? Quite a competitor against the Mets last year. He's had a nice record against the Mets lifetime, 10 and 5. John Olerud, who had a two-run single with the bases loaded to win it. Inside, almost hit him. One and two on Melvin Mora, making his 10th start at shortstop. And the one, two on the way, and it's on the outside corner. So Schilling freezes Melvin Mora. One man away. Let's go around the corner and take a look at the Philadelphia Phillies defensively. At first base, one of the heroes for the Phillies last night, Pat Burrell, hit the ninth inning home run off of Benitez, Kevin Jordan at second. Over at third base, Scott Rowland. And the shortstop is Alex Arias. That's the Phillies on the infield as Derek Bell settles into the batter's box. Bell had one hit last night. Looking at the Phillies in the outfield, Ron Gant is in left. Doug Glanville in center. And Brian Hunter is in right field. to Bell off the outside corner. Mike Lieberthal behind the plate catching Kurt Schilling who is behind Derek Bell two and nothing. Derek only one for 21 in his career against Schilling. And the 2-0 from Schilling. A little bit high breaking ball and it's 3-0. When Schilling has his good stuff, you'll see 85% fastballs. He has a lot of confidence in the velocity and also his location. That's a strike at the knees, three and one. They say in his last start, Friday night, as you see what Derek Bell has not done against Schilling in the past, that in Schilling's last start Friday night in Atlanta or against Atlanta in Philadelphia, he was able to muscle up when he had to. Three and two now to Bell. And even though he was around 88, between 88 and 91 on the gun most of the way on Friday night, when he got into trouble a little bit later in the game and he pitched eight innings, he was able to get to 92, 93. And they found that very encouraging. All the scouts with their speed guns. Checking out Schilling's velocity. And the payoff pitch on the inside corner. So the fastball, the two-seamer, comes back to get Bell. Two strikeouts base. for Schilling, Number both 13. looking. Two batters, Edgardo two strikeouts. Alfonso. First Mora, and now Derek Bell. He comes back 3-0 and oh, and throws and three straight strikes and gets Bell. Take a look at our pitching matchups. The lifetime numbers brought to you by the New York Marriott Marquis, Broadway's biggest hit. A few more wins for Schilling. More losses as well. That's somewhat similar numbers for these two veterans. <laughs> Nothing and one on Edgardo Alfonso. That 343 average ties Fonzie with Jim Edmonds for eighth in the National League. What a year Edmonds is having for the St. Louis Cardinals. See the catch he oh. made last night, Paul. Was that something else? Mm. Climbed the wall, basically used his strength to keep himself up there. And brought the ball back. ball foul nothing in two. Rojas provides a souvenir. Ever see an outfielder play the game as much like a wide receiver as Jim Edmonds does? He's making diving acrobatic circus catches almost every night. He certainly is an outstanding center fielder but baseball features a bunch of them now. Kid in Cincinnati's not there. Alfonso holds his swing one and two. Jim Guffey Jr. Glanville chases those balls down pretty good. Jay Payton gets as good a jump on a baseball as anybody in the league. Made a catch in San Francisco oh. this year that was memorable. Piazza waiting on deck. The one two to Alfonso inside. So again, if you've been watching the readings on Schilling's fastball, it's just barely topping out around 98, 89. But they say he muscled up later in the game. Schilling's always been a workhorse. Likes to work deep into games. All three. He isn't top 90 yet. Pretty interesting to watch. But when he has, when he has his good stuff, there's an 80 
mile per hour slider. He has his good stuff, and his arm is healthy. As I mentioned a moment ago, he gets that ball up there, and he'll get it up there 94, 95 miles an hour with good location. So it'll be a payoff pitch to Alfonso. It's a fastball, and it misses low. So Schilling struck out the first two, got ahead of Alfonso, and now loses him, Number setting up Piazza. Mike Schilling Piazza. didn't want that. Tell by his expression. Look at those numbers. 19 dingers, 52 RBIs. And last night, he got things going early. That's his 19th. Hit it a long way. He just crushes the baseball. Boy, has he changed the atmosphere here at Shea Stadium since the Mets picked him up. Unbelievable. As he often does, he takes a pitch, nothing and one. Look at the numbers. After 58 games, he's having his career year. Look at those numbers. Those three stolen bases are intimidating. You get the 364 average. Catch you. 58 games for Piazza. It deep to left field. That's long gone again. And those numbers just got a little bit fatter. And you could tell when Schilling walked Alfonso, his body language told you the last thing he felt like doing was facing Piazza there, and that's why. Well, we, we mentioned how he has really changed the atmosphere here at Shea Stadium. Schilling will attest to that. Piazza hitting home run number 20, and he got every bit of it. Schilling challenged him. Piazza won. Nothing and one to Robin Ventura. This is a, one of the great swings in baseball. He knew it was gone. He just wanted to watch it and see how far it was going. I don't blame him. Two nights in a row. Two run dinger in the first inning for Piazza. Two to nothing New York. Nothing in two on Ventura. Where did it go? Well, Mike Piazza will have to take a look on our replay to see exactly where the ball went. But he just crushed that ball. We'll have the replay for you as soon as it lands. foul still nothing in two well, Mike Piazza on the highlight shows tonight we'll take a look at exactly where this ball started and where it finished great shot of Ryan Gant he took oh, oh. Gant took one step and then decided to watch it go to the Ventura check swing I mean they generally just don't hit balls into that mezzanine level in either left or right field. Usually home runs that don't go into the bullpen that are hit down the line here. Don't get much higher than that load section, the blue seats. Piazza's gotten up there a couple of times. Makes you wonder how did A.G. ever do what he did. With a dead ball. <laughs> the dead ball era, the 60s, the right. 70s. <laughs> There's Mr. A.G.'s line of achievement. It was foul. Yeah, from, <laughs> from that perspective, you would have to make that call. Larry Jaster still wants it called foul. He's the guy who threw it. Pulled down the first. Earl takes it himself. Cy <laughs> retired. So Schilling, with two strikeouts to start the inning, walked Alfonso, and then came Piazza. Just like that, two to nothing, New York. To what we saw last night. Not that Kurt Schilling wanted to have happen to him. Exactly what happened to Paul Bird, but Mike Piazza got them both. Interestingly, after Mike Lieberthal had grounded into an inning ending double play. First inning last night, first inning tonight. Two run dinger by Piazza. So here we are again. Two to nothing, New York. The 0 1 to Jordan. Jam job. Robin Ventura settles under. One away. Mets baseball is brought to you by Brewery Fresh Budweiser, official beer of Major League Baseball. This Bud's for you. By Propecia, talk to your doctor today. And by Toyota, every day. So 
long gone in the Philly second, and here's Pat Burrell. Nothing in, nothing in one. Interesting matchup right here. Burrell has yet to see Al Leiter. And Burrell is a potentially a 30, 40 home run man a year. You know, Hal McCray, the batting instructor with the Phillies, told me early in the year he has the potential to be a better hitter than Scott Rowland. I was surprised at that. One thing they told us last night was that he likes to take the ball the other way. Well, he did to win the game. Right underneath this, threw him the slider, and Burrell hits the ball over the wall in right field. That's good hitting. You're facing a guy like Benitez who throws that hard. You're still able to reach out with two strikes and hit the ball over the wall. You get a lot of power. I should say that's the home run that tied the game. That was in the ninth inning, leading off against Armando Benitez. Al McRae, the batting instructor with the Phillies. Should be the sliding instructor. Oh, he was dirty. <laughs> and he's a good friend, but he was dirty. I'm surprised somebody didn't kill him with a baseball down there at second base. He and George Brett used to try to do damage to those middle infielders. Earl down on strikes. Two men away. Leiter's second strikeout. The right fielder, number 19, Brian Hunter. Well, he's seen it time and time again. Leiter throwing that. Well, right there, he's taking something off the pitch. Usually he's throwing that hard slider down and in and Burrow way out in front. Leiter's a, over the past couple of years, a completely different pitcher than when he first joined the Mets with all the hard stuff inside. Now he pitches away. I know Tony Gwynn said the one thing that surprised him facing Al Leiter is Al Leiter now throws left-handers inside, where he used to always pitch him away. Great Sandy Koufax has worked with Leiter in spring training about using the other side of the plate as well. When you think of Koufax, you think of some of his contemporaries, one of whom was at Shea Stadium today. The equally brilliant Juan Marichal, who is here helping to promote Meringue Night coming up Friday night. Marichal is an outstanding pitcher with the Giants. Old foul, one and two to Brian Hunter. Marichal won 243 games and completed 245. That's a lot of pitching. Marichal is now the Minister of Sports for the Dominican Republic. One, two on the way. Up the middle and on through. Hunter went up to get it. And the Phillies have their second hit. Two out single by Brian Hunter. The shortstop. Well, I mentioned that Friday night will be the Mets' fourth annual Meringue Night here at Shea Stadium. There is a press conference here at Shea this afternoon. Oh, that's muy mal. Don't say your kid habla en inglés solamente. Uh, I can't translate. I don't know Spanish. It's an honor to be here uh, Bobby's with Juan doing Marichal, that himself. of course, and his beautiful wife. Well, I took three uh, years of Spanish and one, it's an honor for me too. so I'm very comfortable with it. I was going to lean on you there. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Bobby was translating. <laughs> Two out Hunter at first for Alex Arias. That's a strike, nothing in one. So the festivities Friday will get underway at 6.45. Then the Mets and the Pirates at 7.10 and a Meringue concert will begin 15 minutes after the conclusion of the ball game. popular nights of the year here at Shea the last few seasons. Alex Harris pops up to the right side. Alfonso makes a catch to retire the side. Just joining us, Ray out for the year. Todd Z takes ball one from Kurt Schilling. Ray had a split taken off today, and the doctors determined that his fracture was not healing to their satisfaction, so he'll need surgery. They'll install a plate. Latham will stay in Ray's arm until about the first of the new year. So Ray is gone for the rest of the 2000 baseball season. Two and nothing on Zeal. And Schilling, strike on his fastball, two and one. Well, I guess the concern about Todd Zeal taking over for John Olerud is over. Todd Zeal is doing a nice job defensively, not in the category of classic John Olerud, but he is certainly been very impressive with the bat. Well, he just extended a hitting streak to 10 straight games, and that home run by Piazzi in the first the means that Mike is now hitting 44. 11 straight. A couple of hot hitters for the Mets. Here comes another one. 
Zeal on first and nobody out. That'll give Jay Payton a chance. Payton had the Mets' lowest batting average last month, but he's got their best average so far this month, hitting 415 here in June, including two hits last night. Strike to Peyton on the outside corner. Nothing and one. Well, Peyton certainly has a good build for a hitter. As you look at those numbers, how he was talking about 167 in May, really struggling in April 237, but he's now more comfortable and he's put that average up over 280. He considers himself a 300 hitter wherever he plays. It made the swing. It's no balls, two strikes. Now it's 15 straight games now that Jay has started. Well, he's a guy that the Mets, we've talked about it. They've invested a lot of time and money. He was a number one draft pick, an outstanding player. And boy, has he been impressive offensively and defensively. Bobby Valentine was tough on Jay and anybody else during the month of April or May when the player was struggling. But Jay Payton has turned it around. I'm sure Bobby Valentine just as happy for Jay Payton right now. Deep left field, Gant on the run to the wall, off the wall. On his way to third is Zeal, he'll hold there. In the second with a double is Peyton. And the Mets have runners at second and third, nobody out. Boy, is he erasing any doubts about his ability on a major league level. You can see him as a hitter evolving in the major leagues. When he first came up this year, he started playing, he was feeling for the ball. Now, he is really whipping that bat through the hitting zone. It's not an easy pitch to get on top of that ball upstairs. And he's able to hit the ball off the top of the wall. Pretty good job of base running by Todd Zeal there, taking nothing for granted. Not loafing, assuming the ball was going to be caught, but still Zeal without any speed to speak of had to stop well, at third base. I, I think what happened, he was decoyed by Gant. The way Gant went, went to his left on that ball was almost like he might have shot, and then all of a sudden he turned around, looked, and watched it hit the wall. And Zeal was running towards second base because where that ball hit, you shouldn't be around second base as slowly as Zeal was doing it. But I got a feeling right there, you see Gant, now Gant going back like he can make a play. Ball hits off the top of the wall. Todd Zeal had run him. Arias could have thrown the ball to home because Zeal didn't move off third. Peyton rushed towards third and forced. Watch, watch Zeal on third base. He's forced to make a move. He's not going to try and score. Now, Arias, with his back to, I guess he just felt, we're going to give the run. And Zeal sees me playing back, so he's going to break on contact and score easily. But Todd Zeal held his ground. He was forced to move towards the plate when Peyton hustled over to third base. But Arias clearly had a shot by throwing the ball to third to get an out over there. So now they bring the infield in and lighter on a safety squeeze situation. This is the bunt, nothing and one. The safety squeeze, that gives the runner plenty of time to get back to the bag because he's not breaking on the delivery. Suicide squeeze, you come down the line regardless. And now Peyton will come down the line, but the ball kicks foul. So it's nothing and two on lighter. With a pitcher up, a lot of times a third base coach will send you on contact. If he makes contact, a lot of times it's not going to be hit that hard, even though the infield's in. A guy like Peyton breaking on contact, it, he should score. He can fly. I'd hate to see him crush a catcher at home plate. As strong as rocks. Lighter gone on the fastball from Schilling. It's third strikeout. So much for contact. So the two men away, it'll bring up Melvin Morris. Melvin Morris. I know a lot of managers feel that it depends on the hitter. If you get a hitter up that's just kind of slapping at the ball, he's not going to hit the ball real hard, they'll tell you break on contact. That's a pretty good pitch right there. Al Leiter taking strike three. Morris struck out his first time up. No ball, it's one strike on Melvin Morris. tried to bunt his way on last night. The only time he came up with the ball game. But the ball right back to the pitcher. And the 0-1 to 
going to Melvin. Get in the air, deep left field. Can't warning track wall. Makes the catch right against the fence. So Melvin Mora gave it a ride. But it's pulled down by Gant. Lamette settle for one here in the second. There were two hits and one almost. And at the end of two, it's three to nothing, New York. Tammy, what a drive. Yeah, the lessons are really paying off, but you know, you don't get all the credit. Who gets the rest? Dr. Norton. You had LASIK with Dr. Norton, too? Yes, after seeing a live seminar. Wasn't it great? Hearing about it's one thing, but seeing it is something else. Not to mention talking with a patient afterwards. Bill, why didn't you tell me about Dr. Norton sooner? Are you kidding and miss a chance to give you lessons? To schedule a free consultation, call Norton Laser Vision at... Shea, Kurt Schilling will lead off for the Phillies, and the Mets have a 3 to nothing lead against him. Two-run homer by Piazza in the first inning. Zeal a single, Peyton a double, and then a ground ball out by Tyner. Got Zeal home with a third run. So Schilling off of his best start so far this year in an early hole tonight. Strike on the inside corner, nothing and one. Schilling originally signed with the Boston Red Sox. He was traded away to Baltimore. Thing and two on Schilling. Schilling went from the Orioles to the Houston Astros for one year. That was back in 1991. Pretty good company there, though. Still nothing and two on Schilling. He's a real student, not only of pitching, but especially of his own performances. Schilling is. In fact, he downloads every pitch that he's thrown since 1993 now onto a laptop computer. Schilling down on strikes. Three strikeouts for Leiter. One out in the third. Let's check in with Matt Lachlan, Matty. Well, Howie Number Rose, six, Mike Piazza's home run in the first inning clearly was an unbelievable blast as he excited the fans here at Shea. It wound up reaching the mezzanine down the left field line, and then it rebounded off toward the bleacher area. The ball actually bounced off the railing here. Chris Anderson, 13 years old from West Islip, was the nearest person to it. And Chris, you were running, but the ball kind of carried. The wind on the uh, shot went, took it far left. I mean, I tried to get underneath the railing, but <laughs> I just couldn't get there in time. He really crushed the ball. Now, Chris plays ball. He's a pitcher. You ever see anybody hit the ball that hard, that far? Never. I mean, I, people have hit shots off me, but never that hard. <laughs> well, Chris came close, fellas, and uh, Mike, a little something for him to talk about anyway off that Piazza home run. That's neat, a 13-year-old self-deprecating pitcher. Piazza's done that to plenty. Much older than him, too. But, you know, it's funny, when you talk about swings, usually the classic swings, you talk about left-handed hitters. Piazza, for a right-handed hitter, has a classic swing. So does Mark McGuire. Talked about him a number of times about that stride he has. He never overstrides. Good time to see that face. Leiter misses away to Glanville, three and one. One of the things hitters are always concerned with is their stride, whether they're overstriding, lunging at the ball, but he never does it because of his stride. It's usually from the waist up. Three one to Glanville over on the outside corner. So Leiter runs a full count. Now his walk one is struck out three. Three nothing New York. We're in the third. Came inside to him. It's a fair ball. Oh, oh, throw. And, uh, oh boy. Well, he made the pick, but he was off the base. Yeah, he was off the base. He had to come off the base to scoop that ball. And when he came off the base, Kerwin Danley, the first base umpire, did miss a good call by Danley. The left fielder. Number five, Ron Gant. Like a somewhat easy play for Ventura. Maybe a little too much time, because he has a good strong throwing arm. He just flips it across the infield. The ball bounces in the dirt. And the zeal comes off. He comes off the base to catch his ball. See Al Leiter's reaction to it, because it looks like an easy bounce. The reaction, he thinks this is an out. Oh, boy. Rod Gant 
goes after the next pitch and lines it towards the left field corner. That's a fair ball. Tyner up with it. Around third is Glanville. He'll be held there. And in at second with a two base hit is Gant. The Phillies have runners at second and third. One out. So the error having an effect on Al Leiter. Ron Gant picking up a base hit in the left field. After the error by Ventura, Gant hits the next pitch into the left field corner. And the Phillies have two in scoring position for Scott Rowland. Second hit of the game for Gant. And he muscles the ball into left field. So Ron Gant picking up a double. He's on second base and over on third. Doug Glanville. So good speed aboard. And a couple of good hitters scheduled up in Rowland and Lieberthal. Roland walked on four pitches his first time up. Mets have the infield set back. They have a three-nothing lead. Way inside, ball one. Well, Scott Roland with the base open once again. Al Leiter will pitch to Roland with Lieberthal on deck. Roland struggling with his average this year, batting 257. He's been struggling with a bad back, although Lieberthal, who's on deck, is starting to pick up the pace offensively. A lot of room in the gap to the pull side, painting the other way. Two and nothing now to Roland. The one thing you have in your favor in a situation like this, if you do walk Roland, is you load the bases up, you have a force at every base. But again, you have a good hitter coming to the plate, Mike Lieberthal. Lieberthal getting the game-winning hit in last night's ball game. Rounded into a double play in the first inning, as he did last night. So the 2-0 to Inside and low, and Al Leiter a pitch away from loading him up. Roland just now getting into real good playing shape. Hurt his ankle earlier in the year, was on the DL. It's a strike three and one. Of course, he had back problems last year. Well, it's a pretty good pitch for Roland to rip. Leiter throwing the ball in the middle of the plate. So three and one to Roland. Runners at second and third. One man out. Manville and Gant the runner. And now the count runs full. The one thing Al Leiter has in his favor is that open base. Now as you look at Lieberthal on deck. We've seen Leiter throw that nasty breaking ball. But a lot of times it's such a big break on an inside to a right handed hitter. It's out of the strike zone. Here's the payoff pitch. And it's fouled away again. Now Roland steps out. Like last night, the Phillies have loaded their lineup. Remember last night, a lefty Hampton started. Now it's lighter. All right-handed hitters against him. Ball four. They're loaded up for Lieberthal. Well, there's one thing. The one way you can look at it, if you're a Met player, is you've loaded the bases up. You have a force in every base, and when you have a force in every base, you might be able to turn a double play. Lieberthal, first time up, hitting into a five-four-three double play. That was nice relay on the part of Alfonso. Not that easy a ball to handle and flip to first. Well, Hampton got Lieberthal. They hit it on the ground with runners at the corners and one out in the first inning last night. Leiter did it tonight with runners at first and second in the first inning, as you just saw. Of course, Lieberthal had the game-winning hit last night. So again, the infield back at double play death. The tying runs on base, and Lieberthal hits it down the left field line, hooking towards the corner, a foul ball. Lieberthal gave it a pretty good ride. But a long strike, and it's nothing and one. So he's handled lighter well over the course of his career, and he's hammered the Mets this year. Even with that first inning double play, he's 7 for 17 against New York with a couple of home runs. He was a one-time first draft pick for the Phillies, and it took him a while to evolve into a solid catcher, but he's a complete catcher. Lieberthal's a good offensive player and a very good defensive catcher. Inside, one and one. 
Phillies feel he's the best throwing catcher in the National League. Just a few short years ago, I remember when we were doing a game in Philadelphia, a pitcher was complaining about Lieberthal's ability to handle pitchers and call a game, and shortly thereafter, the pitcher wasn't with the Phillies. Another ground ball, but this one stays fair. Down the left field line, Granville has scored, Gantz scores, to third is Rolo, oh, just boy. gets back to the bag. As in the second with a double is Lieberthal, it's a three to two game, but Ventura thought that he had Roland, who would overrun third, trying to get back to the bag. Third base up, Dan Morrison said no, but he hasn't convinced Ventura. Oh, it's now a three to two men lead. Tying run is now at third, the go ahead run at second. And once again, good hitting by Lieberthal, but watch him play at third base. The throw to Ventura quickly puts the glove down. He got him. He's out. So another look, Ventura tagging Roland. Of course, an umpire only has a moment to pick to pick a position to call it, and he might have been out of position. Kevin Jordan, first ball hitting, loops one to short right. Bell makes the catch, Roland tags, here he comes down the line, and the throw not in time. So give Jordan credit for a sacrifice fly, and the Phillies have tied the game. Jordan hitting the first pitch from Leiter. Only the medium baseman, depth three, right field. And Derek Bell's throw just up the first baseline a bit. Tough to throw Roland out to play. Roland has real good speed. He had Morris in the third base umpire. Robin Ventura's still upset with the call. Here's the throw again from Derek Bell. A little bit to the first base side of home plate. Roland with real good speed gets in ahead of the tag. We have a tie ball. Now it's Pat Burrow. Now it's the first pitch off. Nothing at one. Burrow was struck out by Leiter in the second inning. So the Phillies with three runs here in the third have come right back to tie. Remember that error by Ventura on the ground ball hit by Glanville. Would have been two outs, nobody on. And that throw got Glanville. Then Gant doubled, Roland walked, Lieberthal doubled in two, and now Jordan sacked fly has tied the ball game. Well, the old saying that errors are part of the game, but it still hurts. Robin Ventura, who's usually as steady as anybody in the game, six gold gloves, makes an error here in the third inning, and he came back to haunt the Mets. Tied up, Burl, and it's 0-2. Leiter pretty much dominated the Brewers in his last start on Friday. Going eight innings, giving up just three hits and a run, striking out seven. He's had runners on in all three innings tonight. But Burl is down on strikes and the side retired. However, seven Phillies come to the plate of the third inning and three of them score. There were two hits and an error. Phillies lead one. Ventura thought he had one at third, but we're all even. With Geico Mets on deck at 6.30, and then it's the Mets and the Phillies at 7, right here on Fox Sports Net. So the Phillies have tied it. Three in the third inning. It's a 3-3 game. Derek Bell, Edgardo Alfonso, and Mike Piazza to hit against Kurt Schilling. And we'll see if Schilling is somewhat revitalized by these three runs. Bell struck out his first time up. One thing you got to keep in mind, the Fischilian has come off arm surgery, and usually it takes a while for a pitcher to get back to his old velocity. Some guys surpass their old velocity after arm surgery. That's hard to believe because at one time when a pitcher had arm surgery, it was pretty much over. They never regained that great velocity again, but medical science has taken huge steps. It'll be an 0-2 to Derek Bell. And that's just low. Remember, they shut Schilling down on the 8th of September last year because of those shoulder problems, but they didn't do the surgery until the middle part of December, which is a little later, I think, than the Phillies wanted and that Schilling expected. So that compromised his ability to get ready for this year. 
Low and away. They want to check the swing at first, but nothing doing, according to Kerwin Danley. It's two and two. We noted earlier in the ball game how Schilling wasn't wasn't getting over the 90 mile per hour mark, and he lives around 94, 95, 96 when he had the real strong, healthy arm. He'll get back there. He's throwing more sliders tonight. by Bell, but right at the second base from Jordan. That's the first down here in the home third. Schilling has now retired four in a row. The second base. will bring up Edgardo Alfonso. Edgardo Alfonso. The guy that Schilling worked with during his rehab, Robin Ventura, in the hole here with Piazza on deck. But the guy that Schilling worked with during his rehab was a former pitching coach of his, Johnny Padres, for a memorable name to people who remember the Brooklyn Dodgers. Schilling absolutely swears by Padres. That's to take nothing away from his current pitching coach, Galen Sisko, but he says what Johnny Padres can teach you to do in 10 minutes, it takes most guys 10 years to do. Well, it's funny, Johnny Padres was known to have the, one of the great changeups of all time, and Schilling is a power pitcher with no changeup. Fastball slider. And they did work on that changeup during the rehab starts that he made in April. All pitchers get to Schilling's age. Was he now 33? He'll turn 34 in November. And start thinking about other weapons. Well, a series of adjustments throughout your career, especially as you get older. And I, you can, it's great to have that straight changeup. I think it's an excellent pitch. If you don't have the straight changeup, very important part of pitching is to change speeds off your fastball. Hits it in the air to center field. Landville drifting back. He has room. And he makes the catch two away. So Alfonso gave it a pretty good ride, but not nearly as far as Mike Piazza did in the first inning. Well, it's been a while since Mike Piazza's gone deep twice in one game. But he went, he went awfully deep right up there. He went awfully deep here at Shea Stadium tonight. Look at that for a bolt from home plate. So there is a long, long way. And we go back to the first inning. Watch this. What a swing. Who said you need a high leg kick to hit a ball a long way? This one, a one hopper to the shortstop areas. So a strong inning for Schilling. He gets the Mets in order. In fact, he's retired his last six in a row. Any trivia questions. Shutouts. Kurt Schilling has got 14 of them. As far as the major league record is concerned, lifetime. Well, I mentioned a couple of guys earlier in the game. We'd have to consider candidates. Mr. Koufax, Mr. Marischal, on Marischal at the ballpark today, promoting the upcoming Meringue Night festivities. And Sandy Koufax got all his shutouts in six years. That's, well, I'll tell they you what. Probably had them more than anybody. Do you go back to the Christy Mathewson era? You caught him, didn't you? Yes, I did. He had good stuff. Bottom third of the Phillies order. Brian Hunter going after the first pitch. Fouls it down the third baseline. Nothing in one. Hunter, Arias, and Schilling for Philadelphia against Al Leiter. Hunter with a single to center back in the second inning. Robin is still not convinced about that play at third base when Scott Rowland certainly well, he was to out. our cameras looked dead. Well, he was out. Even to the naked eye, to our cameras, to people in the parking lot. And the 0-2 fouled off. Take a look at this play again. And as we mentioned at the time, an umpire only has a moment to get into position, and he's out. But he was safe. And then Scott Rowland tied the game. That was the tie and run. <laughs> Travis Katzenmeyer, the second base umpire, had come down to make the call because that was the continuation of the double that was hit by Lieberthal. Rowland had gone to third and was trying to get back to the bag. So if Dan Morrison is hearing anything from Ventura, he's probably saying, don't blame me, look down to second. Now players talk to umpires throughout the ball game. They're not necessarily talking about that play. Line to left field, and Hunter has a leadoff single. So for the first time tonight, the Phillies have the leadoff man on. It comes here in the fourth inning. Now, Katzenmeyer, the second base umpire, going over to make that call. Clearly, you would have Ventura blocking your view. If you had just a few feet to your right, it, it's tough to get into position, make that call, but our cameras did not miss it. Alex Arias popped to second his first time up. 
He's playing shortstop because Desi Relifer, the incumbent, has had all kinds of problems offensively and defensively. Inside for a ball, 1-0. and oh. Relaford was perfect for the first part of the season in terms of errors. But over the last 38 games he played, he's made 19 errors. That's an error every other game, and he hasn't hit either. That's, that's a bad that, combination. Yeah, that's a case of losing your count. Yeah. One ball, one strike to Arias. And by the way, as far as Bobby Abreu, who was late last night coming to the ballpark, the reason he's not in the lineup tonight, some more discipline. Yeah, the old continuation play. Mm -hmm. The rule the Phillies manager Terry Francona has is that if you're not there when the bus gets there, you don't play. The feeling around the Phillies and talking to some of their people before the game is that every once in a while you've just got to rattle the Brayu's world a little bit. He's one of those players that needs the occasional wake-up call, and Terry Francona sounded the alarm two nights in a row. Line caught by Ventura, and he won't even make the throw. Made Hunter get that uniform dirty. Nice play by Ventura. One away. Reaction position. You better have good reactions if you're going to play third base. A few weeks ago, we saw Cal Ripken jump. Well, Ventura jumped. Quickly came down, was ready to throw, but Hunter got back. So now Zeal and Leiter talking about how they'll handing the, handle this Kurt Schilling at bat. You would think that Kurt would be bunting here. Yeah. He's only one out of 17 as a hitter. And he'd be, he would be bunting right now. It would be a big surprise if he doesn't bunt. Ventura coming down the line from third as they try to keep the runner at first, Brian Hunter, close to the band. Sometimes if the manager has confidence in his pitcher's ability to make contact, he'll send the runner, play a little hit and run. Not here, though, and that's why. So he pops the bunt up and... Zeal trying to drop and force a double play. But the out called it immediately, and Ventura wants to know why. Well, it, hit, it was in his glove. <laughs> but he's trying That's to... why. <laughs> he had it in his glove and let it go to the ground. You're supposed to just pat it gently Sir, down to the ground. The rule book says you cannot way. deceive the runner. This here, attempted deception. Look at that. That was, that was squarely in the pocket, wasn't it? Well, really, that's why they put the infield fly rule into the book. But that's only, of course, invoked with runners at first and second right. or the bases loaded. But they wanted to avoid plays just like that. That's why the infield fly rule exists. So we know that they have no confidence in Schilling's ability to swing the bat. And maybe not much in his ability to bunt either as he pops the bunt up. Now there are two men away and Hunter still at first base. 1-0 to Glanville. Gets away from Piazza. Hunter down to second. And the go-ahead run moves up. That pitch in the dirt should be a wild pitch. I would say blocking Al Leiter slider is about as tough as any pitch in baseball because it just keeps biting. And after it hits the ground, it bites you. Bites up your body and bites away. A lot of biting. But it's tough to keep this pitch in front of you as a catcher. The curveball, the overhand curveball, is a lot easier to block. It's more of a predictable pitch. That slider is just very difficult to keep in front of you. Is that because of the power of the pitch yeah. and the rotation? Yes, yes. The overhand curveball, like I said, there's somewhat of a predictability. A softer pitch? Yeah, and it, you know, it's going to bounce and take more of a true hop where the ball that lighter throws, when it hits, it just, it, it'll eat you up if you're a catcher. That one eats Glanville up, but it's two and one. There's a little more action on that slider for oh, a yeah. catcher to deal with. I mean, if you, if you had your druthers and you could pick a pitch that you would prefer in the dirt, it's the overhand curveball. I figured you'd pick the wiffle ball. Yes. You don't want the fastball. That usually catches you by surprise. That hurts even more when you're surprised. 2-1 to Glanville. And the slider misses inside. So lighter behind, three balls and a strike with Ron Gant on deck. The guy who has two hits already in the ball game. Phillies have out-hit the Mets to this point, 5-3. to three. The Score tied at three. Glanville trying to change that. Jay Payton shallow and around towards right. 
but it's pulled to left field. Tyner gets there. And the side retired, like a handcuff Tyner. But Leiter works out of it. A leadoff hit by Hunter. Nothing more. Middle of the fourth inning. Here at Shea. The Mets three. And the Phillies three. Last of the fourth inning, let's get back to that Aflac trivia question. The all-time Major League record holder for career shutouts. Well, that was the Christy Mathewson era. It wasn't Christy, though. Robin Ventura takes strike one. They Ventura, Zeal, and Peyton here in the fourth. Walter Johnson had the record. They said all Walter Johnson threw was a fastball. He must have thrown extremely hard. He's called the Big Train. He enjoyed his big years in Washington with those senators. So Ventura trying to extend a modest hitting streak that has had seven games. Robin still trying to break out offensively. His power numbers, his run producing numbers are certainly pretty good. 14 and 44. Not quite at the halfway point yet, so He'll take those numbers, but in terms of getting on base, being a little bit more consistent, well, that's something Robin is still trying to establish. Two balls, two strikes now. Clearly, Alfonso and Piazza have been the Mets' two most consistent hitters, and you knew that would probably be the case going in. Jay Payton has picked it up over the last few weeks, as has Todd Zeal. Ventura still trying to break out. Eric Bell got off to that great start, has cooled down dramatically. And the payoff pitch popped up. Short left center. The shortstop Arias called off by Gann and then Glanville. So a catch by committee, and it's Glanville who chaired it. Well, they say the center fielder's got to take charge. First the shortstop did, then the left fielder did. Finally, Glanville said, I'll take it, boys. Well, the big thing is you got to be able to hear the center fielder. And he certainly has to take charge. But it looked like Glanville was more concerned about getting to the ball. He's yelling. He's yelling. I got it. Arias making, getting out of his way, but I guess Ron Gant didn't hear him. A strike to Zeal, nothing in one. You're talking about certain players struggling now. The best thing a, a team can hope for during the course of 162 games is they don't have a team offensive slump. You can deal with the guy here and the guy there slumping, but occasionally when you see a team go into a slump for two weeks, they get clobbered. Well, the Mets have been streaky from an offensive standpoint all year. But they really haven't had a complete offensive slump, a team offensive slump. One ball, two strikes now on Zeal. I think the one thing that's been most surprising about the Mets is that they haven't handled left-handed pitchers better than they have, considering this is a predominantly right-handed hitting lineup. One, two to Zeal, just misses inside. Mets have only hit 227 against left-handers. and You would think, looking at this lineup, that facing left-handers would provide golden opportunities. So throw the stats out the window. Well, to this point, that, anyways. Well, that's an overrated stat. You think Mike Piazza hits left-handers better than right-handers or Derek Bell? If either, when, when, you, when you're swinging a bat well, you're as comfortable, or maybe even more comfortable if you're a right-handed hitter against right-handed pitching because you see more. In this case, you can't budge him off the plate. I think he'd be an exception, Piazza, simply because he's an, an elite hitter. Alfonso, I, I think well, that, that... those two, those are the guys we talked about being the most consistent. Well, I think that right-handed hitter is comfortable with right-handed pitchers. Easy play at second for Jordan, two away. Well, make sure to tune into Metro this tomorrow night at 10.30 for Number Game four. Face. Join GDP. host Dave Sims, who this week will be joined by the WNEW Morning Show sports guy, Scott and Sid. So Dave will also preview the NBA draft with Hofstra's men's basketball coach Jay Wright. So tune in tomorrow night at 10.30 p.m. on Metro. Well, Schilling settling in now. Has retired eight in a row. Peyton doubled his last time up, the last Met to reach off of Schilling. Dave Sims about a week ago had Todd Zee on his show, the uh, audience participation. 
years ago has participated very well with that bat, Jay Payton. Got the average up now to 287. Off the outside corner, a ball and a strike. Well, he was struggling about a month ago. Look what he's doing now. Jay Payton with six home runs. You're looking at the rest of the rookie roster of home run hitters. This brought to you by British Airways. Two and one now to Jay. Payton just missed a home run his first at bat. Put the ball off the top of the left field fence. Did on the first pitch. Peyton go after going after the slider away, and it's two and two. So it's not been the shilling that we've been used to seeing in terms of that overpowering and overabundance use of the fastball. But he gets Peyton here. Foul tip that's held by Lieberthal. Flushing Bay and into Shea Stadium. The Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies in a 3-3 tie as we head to the fifth inning. And for the play-by-play, -play, we reintroduce a man who's gobbled up just about everything they've sold at the concession stands <laughs> here at Shea at one time or another. Fran Healy. And I've enjoyed every moment of it as Ron Gann takes outside ball one. We're all tied at three, the Phillies and the Mets. Gant played his first year in pro ball back in 1983. 1993, 10 years later, he had his best year as far as home runs and RBIs. He was with the Braves. He had 36 and drove in 117. Takes down low. 2-0 on Gant. He's 2 for 2 in his game. He has a single. He has a double. He has scored a run. Five hits for the Phillies tonight. Three for the Mets. One of those hits, a long home run off the dynamite behind. Gant fouls the ball back and out of play. Second game of the three-game series between the Phils and the Mets. Final game tomorrow night. Tickets still available. Supposed to have good weather here in the New York area. So come on out to Shea. Enjoy Met baseball. Can't make it out. We'll bring you all the action right here on Fox Sports Net. Shea Stadium, Flushing, New York. Swung on and missed. Two balls and two strikes. And one in June in his three seasons with the Mets. Gets Gant to foul the ball off. Still two balls and two strikes and run Gant. Nobody out here in the fifth. Talked about talked about lighter in June with the Mets. How about the rest of his career? He's 23 and 8 in the month of June. Yeah, you know what kind of company that keeps him in? Pull at these records. Yeah, we mentioned one of them before. Only two pitchers with a better winning percentage in June. Koufax and Whitey Ford. So the top three all up. Swing around and miss. Gantz goes down and he's not happy. Swinging and missing one out. If you're just joining us, the big news, Third Ray Ordonez out Scott for the rolling. year. Matty Lachlan asks Steve Phillips if he's satisfied with what he has now at shortstop. Yeah, I think these guys have done the job. I mean, you can only base it upon what they show you they can do and what they can't do. And I think that they've more than adequately, adequately played defense. Uh, and the one thing is, you know, Ray's offensive contribution wasn't, uh, you know, doesn't impact us as much as Piazza Alfonso uh, might if we lost them. So, uh, no, I think we're going to be okay. It's a loss. There's no question about it. I mean, Ray is obviously the best defensive shortstop in the National League, and, and it's a loss to us, but it's one that we're going to find a way to overcome. And are there any long-term effects of this? Will he be okay for the spring? No, he should be fine. I think that the plate will stay in his forearm until about January 1st, somewhere around there. They'll take it out, and he should be ready to go come next year. Well, Scott Rowland, the batter, 0-2 on Rowland, who's only 25 years old. Up high. Boy, you know what's interesting about this Ordonia situation is that people have speculated about the Mets' potential interest in Alex Rodriguez. And, I mean, certainly the Mets are in no position. They can't comment on that. Can't get into a tampering situation. I wonder if this compromises that. Up high to Rowland. Two balls and two strikes. Well, one thing is, Ray Ordonez, if he was going to be included in that trade, you know what you would get 
with Ray. Ray's got a four-year contract. Rodriguez is a guy who becomes a free agent. You see the number 10 on the hat of Edgardo Alfonso up high. Ray Ordonez is number 10. Also, Melvin Mora has it on his hat. You see that number 10? Three and two. Foul ball. So we'll rack them up and do it again at three and two. Interestingly, a former Mets shortstop was traded to New York last night, late last night. Jim Larence went from the Yankees to the Dodgers. And Jose Vizcaino is with the Yankees. They might be thinking about some action at second base with the Yankees. Chuck Knobloch. Outside the wall. He walks. So Scott Rowland, a base runner with one man down here in the top of the fifth inning. 24, Mike Lieberthal. Dave Wallace looking at him. Along with the manager, Bobby Valentine. Mike Lieberthal will step to the plate. Bobby Valentine has seen just about a, as much of Mike Lieberthal as he really wants to see. Lieberthal driving into winning run in last night's ball game. One for two tonight. He's got a two-run double. Roland can run. He's the base runner. There he goes. Fake me up. I was coming out of the shoot. Well, you know what? He went a pretty good way down the line. He went not quite a third of the way, but he took several steps as though he were going to go hard the second. It's a pretty good distance before pulling up. So again, Roland with a decoy. Yeah, he was faking all the way. You're taught as a catcher on every pitch with the runner on first base. You come out of the shoot. You don't come up. You come out of the shoot long. The reason you don't want to come up is you don't want to take the pitch away from the home plate umpire. And you want to be ready to throw the ball to second base. Roland leading off first with speed. 1-0 on Lieberthal. We're all tied at three. The Phillies and the Mets, top of the fifth inning. Outside. 2-0. Two balls, no strikes. Second game of this three-game series as Mike Piazza flashes signs to Al Leiter. Pitch right there, two and one. Braves coming into tonight's action with a four-and-a-half game lead over the Mets. They are trailing the Cubs 3-0 in Atlanta right now. Bobby Valentine is pacing. They check rolling in first base. Central Division, the Cardinals with a six and a half game lead over the Reds. The West is Arizona with a half game lead over the Rockets. If you're going to send Scott Rowland from first, this might be the pitch to do it. Two and one. And Leiter thinking the same way, trying to keep him close. Lieberthal, pretty much a pull hitter. So you would think in this situation that if Terry Francona was going to put the hit and run on, that Edgardo Alfonso, the second baseman, would be covering. See what happens. And Lieberthal hits a fly ball center field. Payton with a good jump makes the grab and Roland hustles back to first base. So two men are out here in the fifth. Now we'll take a look at where the Mets Second will baseman, play number 23, the next few games on our Delta Airlines schedule. In New York, right here at Shea Stadium. As the Mets have a few more games at home to play than on the road now. One more with the Phillies. We'll have that for you tomorrow night. Then the Pirates come in. Meringue night here at Shea Friday. We'll have that one for you. And the WB-11 takes Saturday and Sunday's games. All brought to you by Delta Airlines. Delta planes right there at LaGuardia Airport as Leiter checks rolling again at first base. Two men are gone. Kevin Jordan, the battery's over one. He also has a sacrifice fly. Jordan takes a strike, so it's 0-1 on Kevin Jordan. Jordan playing second base for the Phillies, getting some playing time. Mickey Morandini is not going to face Al Leiter. He didn't face Mike Hampton. He has struggled against left-handers. Here's the 0-1 pitch. Right back up the middle. Nice job by Leiter. Loving that ball. Easy flip to Zeal. 
So Al Leiter fielding his position, taking a base hit away from Kevin Jordan. And here in the fifth inning, the Phillies strand to run it. They feel the score after four and a half on the scoreboard. We're all tied at three. And take a look at this. Right back to Leiter. Quick hand. A save and a beauty. Well, if you're going to beat Al Leiter, you've basically got to shoot to the stick side. He's got a pretty good glove. There's a drive going glove side, but Leiter is there. And nice save by Al. Jason Tyner, the batter, takes a strike from Kurt Schilling. 0-1 on the Met left fielder. As you look at the pitching matchup, Kurt Schilling, Al Leiter, we're all tied at three. It's a very marquee pitching matchup. Brought one ball, you. one strike on Tyner. Brought to you by New York Marriott Marquis, Broadway's biggest hit. Rolling way down the grass. Tyner takes inside. Two and one. You see Scott rolling. He's telling Tyner, hit it past me. As time goes on, Tyner will get that swing and he will hit it past me. Three balls and one strike. That's a great deal of respect for his speed. Remember how Pete Rose yeah, played know. against Mickey Rivers in the World Series mm -hmm. one year? Daring him to basically drop one down. Same thing here. There's a the strike. So now Roland will drift back a little deeper on Tyner. Here's a great time to bunt the ball. Catch Roland completely by surprise. Here's a 3-2 pitch. Loops it down the left field line, Gant going over and cannot make the grab. It's out of play. So we'll do it again at three and two. Tyner coming into tonight's action, batting 229. Now he's at 222. And he slaps it down at third baseline, but it's foul. Well, had he been able to do that before the count got to two strikes, given where Roland had been playing him, Tyner would have himself, Ooh. of course, had the ball stayed fair. A two base hit. But it's where it goes over the base. Right. Does it go over the base? Well, again, a rookie such as Jay Tyner is in no position to make much of a fuss. So he doesn't. And a 3-2 pitch. Now ball up the middle. Play for Arias. He flips the burrow. One down. Well, fans, don't miss the premiere of MetZone, presented by Keyspan Energy. Oh, MetZone is a weekly half-hour baseball program for kids it's good and their show. families. That's a good-looking show. Yeah, it aired up on the uh, Diamond Vision board here today. It'll air every Saturday at 11 a.m. on Fox Sports Net. Have a rap session with Robin Ventura and a whole lot more. Now yeah. light is the battery takes us. So a special look at the Mets all-time winning as pitcher Tom Seaver. An explanation of the scientific principle that causes a curveball to curve. Straighten out a few hitters. It certainly did. Foul out of play. The man who came up with the idea for that curveball, who really should have been shot, <laughs> was Candy Cummings. He's in the Hall of Fame, and he had a losing record, but boy, oh boy, did he ruin some nights for hitters. They should have outlawed that pitch. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Ryder fouls it back and knocks the mask off of Mike Liebenthal. Yeah, but just think, if games were all fastballs, you'd be playing all night. Oh, but, if, you know, he could a peaceful sleep. Well, Liebenthal won't, not after that. <laughs> you, He'll be hearing bells right up until the alarm goes off. That's when you question, why did I pick this position? It's outside, one and two on Al Leiter. How about when they used to play this game and they didn't wear catching equipment? You knew if the manager said, you're my catcher, he didn't like you. There's a looper in the left field. So Al Leiter picking up a base hit. And the Mets have a base runner with one man out here in the fifth. Second knock of the year for Al Leiter. He's now two out of 29. Number six, Melvin Mora. And the dugout gets a bit of a kick out of it as well. <laughs> Darrell Hamilton, still about a week away from his rehab assignment, leading the cheers. Thanks for that, Melvin 
Morris takes up high from Kurt Schilling. Morris struck out and he flat out this ball game. Great opportunity for Melvin Mora and for Kurt Abbott. Unfortunately, it took an injury to Ray Ordonez to give them the opportunity. The 1 0 pitch. There's a strike. I talked to Ray Ordonez before the ball game and he seemed quite surprised when he was told operation and you're out the rest of the year because he felt he was on his way back to getting back into the lineup. So Ray before the ball game in the Met Clubhouse. Here's the one more pitch to outside. Two and one. Ray Ordonia showed up 14 pounds heavier this year. Struggled with his bat. So it's up to Mora and Abbott. Here's a two one pitch. There's a looper into left field. A big hit off the bat of Melvin Mora. And the Mets have runners on first and second with one man out. And the batter will be Derek Bell. Well, our cloak book tonight is brought to you by Tri-State Consumer Auto Insurance. Call them right now for your free rate quote. And Darrell Hamilton basically says he's starting out all over again, at least as far as running is concerned, because of the toe injury. He hasn't been able to run on the ball of his foot for three years because of the pain. So it really is like starting over. But he doesn't appear to be too bothered by it right now. Getting ready for Meringue night. Yeah, he and Benny dancing together in a dugout. The game has changed. <laughs> well, when your manager was a champion ballroom dancer, like Bobby Valentine, I guess the other guys have to fall into place and learn the hoof, too. Yeah, Bobby Valentine was an outstanding ballroom dancer. And he was national champion, and he told me it wasn't easy. Met a young lady with Continental Airlines named Bonnie Wrights, who was one of his partners in the ballroom dancing. Bell the batter, runners on first and second, and he fouls the first pitch off. 0 and 1. Bobby told me he used to go from playing football or baseball to a ballroom dancing contest. His, his mom wanted him to learn things other than football and baseball. And he learned it well. See how deep the outfield is here against Bell, how much room in the gaps. Remember now, Al Leiter at second with no speed whatsoever. So it's going to take a long hit even to get him in from second base. The Phillies have the opportunity here to play Bell or play against the long hit with Derek Bell. Bell takes outside. So it's one ball, one strike, and a Met right fielder. Runners in first and second. Derek Bell. Still struggling to find that stroke. He's batting 287 in this ball game. He struck out and grounded out. And he fights that pitch off, but flies out to Brian Hunter in right field. So Bell continues to struggle. The second base. Two down. Number 13, Edgardo Alfonso. And with two men down, one of your money hitters at the plate. Edgardo Alfonso will be the bat. Alfonso in his ball game has walked, scored a run, and flied out. 344 with runners in scoring position. But again, a base hit, a routine single, won't necessarily get lighter home. Although, with two outs, he'll have the luxury of being able to take a little bit bigger lead and get certainly a better jump off the bat running on contact with two away. And Alfonso takes down low, ball one. Mets scored two in the first on a home run off the bat of Mike Piazza, who's on deck. They scored one in the second. Phillies tied the ball game up with three in the third. Leiter leading off second base, Melvin Moore on first. Alfonso gets under it. Wanville gets under it also. And that'll do it for the Mets. So, missed opportunity as the Mets strand two runners. They failed to score. After five innings of play here at Shea Stadium, we're all tied at Please even. As Al Leiter and Kurt Schilling hooked up, pitching to almost identical numbers through the first five innings. Speaking of identical, not only are the pitching numbers, but so are these twins. 
always wondered about that. Dressing identical twins in the same outfit, making them look exactly alike. Don't you want to give them separate identities? Not at that age, it's cute. Yeah, I know it's cute and everything, but sometimes they do it all the way through high school. You don't know who's who. Sometimes that can work uh, out uh, for I a figured, student. I figured you'd take it in that <laughs> direction. That Burl. Fouls off the first pitch from Al Leiter. Burl in his ball game facing Al Leiter. You know, parents dress their kids identically like that. And if you don't see the kids every day, you see them once a month or every six months or whatever, you come upon them and then you get their names wrong and the parents get mad at you. Like, well, can't you tell them apart? <laughs> well, dress them differently and I'll tell them apart. You can tell I've had experience in that category. Right. So you made the mistake, I guess. <laughs> There's a fly ball left field. Jason Tyner in pursuit. And that ball is a home run. So Pat Burrow, who hit a dramatic home run in last night's ball game, has just put the Phillies ahead here in the top of the sixth. And we heard a lot about this kid's power for about a year now. Well, we've learned something about him right, right here in these last 24 hours. He's got power to both fields. Remember last night, the ninth inning, Benitez hung a slider, and Burrell muscled it over the right field wall. Well, here Leiter comes into him, and Burrell is ready for it. He turns and launches it right off of that Newsday sign, well beyond the reach of Jason Tyner. So home runs to both fields. Brian Hunter's the batter. He swings over the breaking ball. 0-1 on Hunter. Well, not quite the Newsday sign, just off that blue padding atop the retired numbers. Burl, not quite sure of the ground rules here, didn't know until the umpire gave him the signal. Inside on Hunter. Hunter's two for two. He's got two singles in this game, but as I mentioned it earlier, Al, Hal McCray, the batting instructor with the Phillies, told me early in the year he thought Burrow was going to be a better hitter than Rowan, and Rowan is a good inside, two and one. See, now, that fence, the lower fence, is three feet in front of the padded wall. So the padded wall, that being the top of the fence there, anything off that padded wall is automatically a home run. That is not part of the fence. Swung on in. Yes, yeah, so it's two and two on Brian Hunter. That didn't always used to be the case here. Those three feet did not always separate wall and fence. That wall used to be the fence. Brian Hunter couldn't check his swing of that slider, so he's out. One man down, but that young man right there hit a home run last night in a crucial spot. Shortstop, off, uh, 26, Alex Arias. Armando Benitez, and now tonight off of Al Leiter. So he's hit two pretty good pitchers and hit them hard with the long ball. Into a fancy neighborhood, too. Casey Stengel, Gil Hodges, Tom Seaver, Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. Retired numbers out there. The man right there started off as a third baseman in college, moved to the outfield in the minor leagues, and now he's at first base. Alex Arias, the batter. 1-0 on the Philly shortstop. 4-3, the Phil's on top of the Mets. Six hits for the Phillies, five for the Mets. There's a strike, 1-1. One one. And the 1-1 one -one pitch. Hard down the left field line. Just foul. Is throwing the head of the bat down into the hitting zone and smoking a ball foul, so it's one and two. That's that ball you usually swing at and you foul tip it off the old ankle. Here's the one two pitch. Ooh, right by him. Two down. Well, here in the sixth inning, the Phillies the have pitcher, taken the lead. Number 38, Kurt Schilling. You see Leiter's pitch count, 99. Well, I believe the Mets don't get alarmed over his, his pitch count because he has, has such a strong arm. Kurt Schilling, the batter, is over two. He hits a fly ball to right field. Derek Bell playing him right there, makes the grab. And that'll do it for the Phillies. But that Leiter gave up a go-ahead home run to that guy right there, Pat Burrow. So Burrow does it again to Phillies. Be sure to stay tuned for more contest detail. Dave Wallace talking to Al Leiter. Al 
giving up that home run to Pat Burrell. We have a one-run ball game. Now, if you like a Met player and you want to help him get on the All-Star team, well, look at this. Yeah, that'll do it. He can spend a couple days filling out the All-Star <laughs> ballot. Are those not balance postage free? <laughs> you can spend a lot just sending them out, too. Unless you can punch them all out here and drop them in the boxes around Shea Stadium. Hard to believe that Gardo Alfonso is not leading oh. Craig Vigio, but maybe with the Mets home for a while now, that'll change. Here's a guy who might be on. Seems like yesterday when Piazza was picked up by the Mets from the Marlins. The day that was when he took a plane from Florida to New York. Bill Beck, the traveling secretary with the Marlins, sent him to the wrong airport. I had a lot of respect for Bill until he did that. He sent you a few wrong places <laughs> over the years, too, didn't Beck? He was in Kansas City when I was there. Oh, and one on Mike Piazza. Down low, one ball and one strike. He gave Piazza. you plane tickets before you were traded to every city in the American <laughs> League, didn't he? Just hoping. Hoping, wishing, <laughs> praying. Piazza hit a long home run for his 20th. He hits the ball out to the bat and roll foul. One and two on Piazza. I mentioned that prior to his last at bat, we haven't seen Mike go downtown twice in one game. Not that often. Can he do it tonight? Mets need a, a run to tie. They trail by a one. Four to three, the Phil's on top of the Mets. Keep in mind, that baseball tomorrow here at Shea State. Final game against the Phillies. Then the Buckos from Pittsburgh come to town. Three game series over the weekend. Here's the one two pitch of the Pulls it foul. Came to the major leagues, as you can see. It's hit showing very well. When he came to the major leagues, he was a breaking ball hitter. He said because he played a lot of ball in Mexico. He saw a lot of breaking balls. Here's one two pitch. Miles it back. And then after he showed he was a breaking ball hitter, major league pitcher said, let's see if he can hit the fastball. Well, he proved he can hit the fastball. So next. Yeah, I know. What's next? Catcher in the history of the game is going to better off as play. Down low, two and two. Johnny Pinch was a great one. Yogi Berra, Roy Campanella, Bill Dickey, Carlton Fisk. Right three to Mike Piazza. Good pitch by Schilling, one down. The third baseman. Number four. So Kurt Schilling Robin picks Ventura. up this fifth strikeout. They hit the target. Leverthal wanted it away. And you see where he set up right on the outside corner. And Schilling couldn't mm. have personally delivered it there any better. So Schilling now will take on Robin Ventura. I was talking about catcher swinging the bat. Only, I believe only one catcher has ever been hitting as Ventura takes a strike. And it was this, one of the slowest running baseball players in the history of the game. His name was Ernie Lombardi, and he led the league in hitting twice. 0-1. Down low, one ball and one strike. They tell me they played Lombardi in the in shallow, shallow in the outfield. The infielders did. And threw him out at first base. Schilling, by the way, getting right up around that 100 pitch mark now, and even as he continues to rehab and get his arm strength back after that surgery, he still wants to go out and pitch deep in the game. He pitched eight innings his last start. He's had a complete game already. 1-1 one, one pitch. Turner drives the ball deep center field. Brando going back, and he makes the grab. Ventura sending Glanville all the way back to the center field wall. Uh, Schilling will exhale as Ventura gave it a real good ride. And Glanville needed all of Shea Stadium to make the catch. Off the bat, looked like it had a chance. Deep to right center, Glanville with a good jump. Not even having the feel for the wall. He knew exactly where he was and made the play. Exhale now. Or not. <laughs> all right, they knew it was coming. 
So Schilling now with two outs will take on Todd Zeal. Zeal is one for two in this game. Single, scored a run. And Schilling and Lieberthal right now talking about Zeal. Well, you know, Kurt Schilling has helped raise over a million dollars for ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. That's a tremendous effort on his part. And we've been telling you over the last 10 days or so about the Cap Cure Home Run Challenge, which wound up last night. Well, 160 home runs were hit, and $8 million were raised for prostate cancer research. All of the money that was pledged goes to Cap Cure, and you can still make contributions. Make sure you jot that number down, 1-800-547-CURE. Keep that in the game. The Cap Cure Home Run Challenge, at least as far as the home run side of it, is over. But you can still make your pledge over $8 million raised for prostate cancer research. And Todd Seal takes outside from Kurt Schilling, 1-0. and oh. What did we get up to last night? 55000 per home run, right? Yep. So Piazza hit one and Burl hit one. $110,000 with two swings of the bat. Seal missing a pitch right there. A little bit out in front. One ball and one strike. It was a breaking ball from Schilling. Measured at 78 miles per hour. One and one on Zeal. You know, last night, the Tigers beat the Blue Jays 18 to 6. There were 10 home runs hit in that game. So that's more than a half a million right there. Mm. Great cause. Two and one at Zeal. Close it to third day. Scott Rowland blocks it. Across the infield it goes. Nice pick by Pat Burrell at first base. And that'll do it for the Mets. Three to nothing lead. The home run by Burrell providing the Phillies with a go-ahead run. So Rowland has been walked three times. Lieberthal had the game-winning hit last night. He's driven in two tonight. Kevin Jordan has also driven in a run. As Kurt Schilling has pitched six innings and has the lead. And it's the top of the Phillies order here in the seventh. Doug Glanville takes a strike from Al Leiter. Yes, since Peyton's second inning double, the Mets hitters are two for 16 against Schilling. Terry Francona, the manager of the Phillies, talking to his ace. Glanville lifts one into short right field. Easy play for Derek Bell. And that's the first out here in the seventh inning. Well, tomorrow on Baseball Thursday, Fox Sportsnet five, will showcase superstar shortstop Alex Rodriguez and the Mariners as they face Cal Ripken in the Orioles. Seattle and Baltimore tomorrow night after the Mets game on Fox Sportsnet. When the Orioles were in town, Cal Ripken Jr. told me that, obviously, Derek Jeter, Alex Rodriguez, and Nomar Garcia-Para are great shortstops. He said if he had to pick one, it would be extremely close, but he would take Rodriguez. Is it bad? It's just all around play. They're all, they're all three of them. Very, very good players. So it's a tough choice. One and zero to Rod Gant. Of course, Arod a better run producer than the other two who aren't bad either. But all kinds of intrigue about Arod. Now you know you wonder if whatever level of interest the Mets might have. How much the Ordonia's injury might change that, but you know, you look at the Mariners in the American League West, and they were only two games behind a red-hot Oakland team. 2-0 to Gant, hit in the air, oh. deep left field, Tyner to the wall, that's a gunner. Third hit of the game for Ron Gant. And the Phillies take a 5-3 lead. Well, as far as the Phillies are concerned, it's a good matchup if you have Gant at the plate with a hard thrower like Al Leiter. Especially that ball coming in on Gant. He likes the ball from the middle of the plate in, and he loves the hard stuff. And we've seen a lot of reactions by Al Leiter, and that's a reaction. He knew it. Tyner going back to the wall, but as soon as he left the bat, that baby's out of here. So 12 home runs now by Gant, and the Phillies have a two-run lead, and here's Roland. Howling went off to the right side, Zeal, hoping, and even with his hustle, unable to come up with it. So Ron Gant, a single, a double, and a home run, and four at-bats. He has been a different hitter over the last few weeks. Got off to a rough start. 
Uh, he has over the last 17 games now been hitting about 350 when you factor in his three out of four tonight. Leiter, who was treated to an early three to nothing lead, has seen the Phillies come back, take a five to three lead, and rolling. Behind in the count, 0 and 1 has not had an official at bat yet. Three walks. Slider missing, 1 and 1. So, Turk Wendell getting ready. The Phillies five runs, seven hits. The Mets three, five, and one. And two on Scott Rowland. You know, when you, when you see a guy like Rowland go up there and hit a ball that far or foul on a, on a pretty good pitch with hard stuff, you know that a guy like Rowland is turning up the dial as far as the speed of his bat because Al throws a lot of hard stuff and you got to get around on him. And Rowland way out in front hits the ball hard but really pulls that ball foul. Two and two now to Rowland. given up home runs each of the last two innings now. Soft line drive. Alfonso over. He's not going to be able to get it there. Though. Piazza backing the play up in front of the dugout. An important play because if that ball rolls into the dugout, then Roland gets second base. But that's a great example of just about how far a catcher should go down to back up. You don't have to go real far. You're going to be behind the first baseman in case of an emergency like this. But going all the way down to back up first base, forget it. Doesn't help out. But right there, he's in position to make the grab as the ball was heading toward the Met dugout. One of the most overrated things in baseball today, because it's changed so much, is the catcher going down and backing up the first baseman on a ground ball to a major league infielder. Here comes Dave Wallace. And Dave going out to talk to Al Leiter, looking to the bullpen. And he's going to go to the pin. So Leiter will leave. The Phillies have taken a 5-3 to three lead. They have a runner on first and one out. And Mike Lieberthal coming up. So Leiter, who led 3 to nothing, will leave trailing by two as Turk went for his <laughs> comments about his mode of transportation when the Braves get to New York next week. Well, here's Turk Wendell to face Lieberthal now with Roland at first and one out and the run in. Really scoring on the Gann home run. Wendell just pitched a third of an inning last night. So Turk has been among the busiest relievers, his 38th appearance. And Lieberthal hits it in the air to center field. Easy for Peyton. Roland was halfway. He'll come back to first. Two gone. You know how we were talking about backing up first base. A lot of times like catchers baseman. would run down full tilt to back up first base. But guys like Piazza and Lieberthal, you don't want them to do that. You want them to stay strong because they're more important swinging the bat. In fact, backing up first base got Richie Ashburn, and they made him an outfielder because he was a catcher when he broke into pro ball. And Richie Ashburn... When a hitter would hit the ball, would run so fast to back up first base, he would beat the runner. <laughs> the manager said, wait a minute. If he's that fast, we're wasting his speed behind the plate. Make him an outfielder. Uh, here's Kevin Jordan. He's the batter that Wendell struck out last night after Turk came on to relieve Armando Benitez following the Lieberthal. Base hit in the 10th inning. It was the only batter the Turk saw. Jordan denied 0 for 2 with a sacrifice fly. Slider away, two and nothing. Hey, Richie Ashburn just didn't like the idea of catching. And so by showing off his speed, he made sure that his manager knew to get him out from behind the plate. Well, he had a long Hall of Fame career because of it, as you look at Dennis Cook. Line softly, more time the leap, but couldn't come up with the ball. So I guess he missed time the slight. <laughs> No, he just couldn't come up with it. Yeah, the Phillies have two on, and Pat Burrell, who last time up, hit a home run off of Leiter to put the Phillies in front, delivered what to now is our Dodge drive of the game. So Burrell going deep last night, and he comes back tonight. 
And he's so strong, he didn't really get a whole lot of that ball, but he got enough of it to hit it over the left field fence. And Burrell, not really knowing the ground rules here at Shea Stadium, figured he better leg it out. Then they told him, slow it down, you can Cadillac. One of two home runs Al Leiter gave up tonight. One of them in this inning to Ron Gant. And the Phillies looking for more insurance here with Roland at second, Jordan at first. And the slider misses downstairs to Burl. Well, you know, Burl's first at bat against Turk Window, and I will guarantee you he's been told you're going to see a lot of sliders. So if you wait long enough, you're going to get one. He hit a hanging slider out over the right field fence last night off Armando Benitez. There's the slider again. It's two pitches, two sliders. Young player, a lot of power. He's hit in the minor league. He hit in college. Find out if he can hit the breaking ball. Two out of the strike zone to Burrow. So uh, two and nothing. And that's Shaneham a step the other way in the outfield. You see Jay Payton, the center fielder, over towards the right center field gap. Yeah. That's a strike, two and one. Yeah, Wendell's one of those pitchers who, when he is behind, he has so much confidence in his breaking ball, he can throw it for strikes. You, you can throw a 2 0 slider, you get a real good chance of getting a called strike. If it's in that strike zone, and that's really not a snapping slider. Foul the way, two and two. Sometimes when you try to snap a slider too much, you come underneath it and it backs up. But it's a pretty good pitch. It's something that pitchers don't try to perfect, but occasionally you get that backup slider and you get the called strike. So Wendell trying to get out of the inning here. With Scott Rowland, the runner at second, Kevin Jordan at first, two and two to Burrow. In the air to right field, and this should end the inning. Eric Bell hustles in a few steps, and the side retired. But not before the Phillies tack one on, as Ron Gant delivered his 12th home run of the year off of Al Leiter. So it's time to stretch here at Shea after the Phillies have stretched their lead. Thanks to Ron Gant. Middle of the seventh, five to three, Philadelphia. Upper Mike Piazza going deep. Jay Payton lines the first pitch towards the right field corner, but a foul ball. I had a chance to talk to Jim Duquette a moment ago. Mets are really high on this pitcher they have, and well, he's going to spot start in double A now. He's oh, only that's a, strange. Oh, he's 8 0 in A ball. Met him last year after the Mets signed a big, strong kid from Springfield, Massachusetts. Matt Strange was supposed to make his first double A start a few days ago, it was rained out, so he'll get another opportunity. They'll bring him up and start for Binghamton against Portland in a couple of days. Good move because they're, they're really not putting pressure on him. Hayden bunts it right back to Schilling. Chili throws a heater to Burrow, one away. You know, when you're a power pitcher, you throw the ball hard. When the ball's hit back to you, you're not comfortable lobbing the ball to first base. The reason is, is you will you will have a very relaxed wrist, and when you have a relaxed wrist, it's tough to control a soft cross, so you've got to put something on the ball. He was trying to bunt it past the pitcher which they'll tell you is the formula for getting on base if you're bunting in that direction. Second baseman, of course, playing back. Nobody out in that spot. So, nothing and one on Jason Tyner. Scott Rowland once again in on the grass trying to take the bunt away from Jason Tyner. And Tyner trying to hit the ball by him. The only way he's going to stop that is if he drills a couple of baseballs by the third baseman. Until then, they might as well come in and play shallow. So Schilling over the 100 pitch mark now here in the seventh inning. A little number foul, one and two. Who does Schilling remind you of? Well, he throws mostly fastballs, but he'll throw the occasional split finger as he had in this game. And Mike Scott certainly well, threw that splitter. Yeah, the split finger pitch for Mike Scott just turned his career around. Kurt Schilling has done it with 85 to 90 percent fastballs. Although Scott had a good fastball, but that split finger pitch really did. One two to Tyner hit in the air center field. The Glanville back, and that's the second out. 
know, we're talking about the big guy in, in the minor leagues, Pat Strange. They're going to have him spot start and double-A ball the way I guess they presented it to him. It's going to be a spot start, and after that, you know, you'll probably go back to A-ball. I got a feeling and if he goes in and he pitches well, they're going to say, you know that spot start? You're going to get another one. It's a great move. You don't put too much pressure on the kid. He's about 18 or 19 years old. But he certainly has the size and the stuff to someday pitch in the major leagues if he's able to stay healthy. And Franco batting for Turk Wendell takes strike one. Talk about that Pat Strange 6'5. It's only 240 pounds. A twig. 0 oh, and 2 now to Franco. From Western Massachusetts. And you on the mound tonight, Turk Wendell from the western part of Massachusetts. Franco. Outside ball one. Man is a pinch hitter this year, only three out of 26. That's trailing by two. Two out, nobody on here in the seventh. Fouled away. Some shilling. Up around the 110 pitch park now. All right, he's one of those bulldogs. Oh, he, he hits. He's like Al Liner. He throws a lot of pitches. But, you know, he said as soon as he came back from the rehab this year, he didn't want to be treated differently. Well, the state of the Phillies pitching staff, I'll guarantee you, Terry Francona is not going to treat him any differently. Yeah, but, you know, he didn't want to be coddled. He didn't want to be nurtured the way you sometimes do with rehabbing pitchers. He said, just give me the ball. Let me go out every fifth day. Don't worry about the pitch count. Don't worry about my arm. I'll let you know if it's bothering me. Franco continues to hang in against him. You know, I see that Terry Francona in the dugout. I think that what a close relationship his dad Tito and I had when I signed with the Cleveland Indians. <laughs> you told me. That's a classic. I was in the batting cage at Yankee Stadium when I just signed with the Indians, and I hear this veteran say, hey, kid, get out of there. <laughs> Welcome to the big leagues, brother. And what you do, you left. 2-2 <laughs> to Frank. Up the middle. And on through past the diving Jordan. And Matt Franco delivers his fourth pinch hit of the year. So, that means Mets get the tying run to the plate. And Kurt Schilling will face time. Melvin Mora. Number six, Melvin Mora. Matt Franco delivering in a spot where the Mets need a base runner. Her chilling going right after him. You know you're going to get a strike from him. And Matt Franco was able to hit that ball up the middle, just out of the reach of Kevin Jordan. Nice effort. Sixth hit for the Mets off of Schilling. The Phillies have nine. So here's Mora, and he hits it hard, but right at Roland, who goes the short one. And that retires the side. So just the two out pinch single by Matt Franco. Nothing more against Schilling. And that's a Rod Gilbert model or a Sean Gilbert model. <laughs> so from the roof here at Shea Stadium, Philadelphia Phillies with a 5-3 lead. Kurt Schilling has allowed six base hits over seven innings. Galen Sisko, the Phillies pitching coach, usually when he does that, means take a shower, you're done. Yeah, Schilling pitched very, very well once again tonight. I mentioned in our open, he pitched a game last year here at Shea Stadium. I thought... Not only was it a well-pitched ball game, but you loved his tenacity. He did not want to come out of the ball game, and he stayed in. He lost the ball game, but what a bulldog effort. Speaking of bulldog, Dennis Cook in the ball game, 23 strikeouts in 25 and two-third innings. So he'll enter the game with the Phillies leading 5-3. to three. He'll face the bottom third of the order, and Schilling will simply hope that his bullpen can hold on. Their closer is Jeff Brantley, who's come back from arm problems himself. Brantley worked a scoreless inning to pick up a save on Monday night in Philadelphia against Atlanta. A scoreless 10th inning last night to pick up the save. So it'll be interesting to see if the Phillies have the lead in a save situation going into the ninth inning if Brantley's their man again three days in a row. Brian, 102 out of three. A couple of singles and a strikeout. And Dennis Cook's first pitch right there. Nothing and one. Oh, it's a win. off the 
outside corner. One ball, one strike to Hunter. He was picked up from the Atlanta Braves on waivers back in April. A huge hit against the Mets in the playoffs last year. For the Braves. Two and one down to Hunter. There was a shot of Dennis Cook exhaling, trying to relax himself because when you relax, the muscles are relaxed, you get better velocity, better control of your pitches. I guess that one emotion you see most on the face of Major League Baseball players is the relaxation technique of exhaling. How many times do you see whether it's a hitter or a pitcher trying to relax those muscles? Roll to the right side. Alfonso throws out Hunter one away. One of the dilemmas that go along with the slump, and I'm sure Derek Bell is Short fighting shot. that, Number 26, is Alex Arias. no matter what you do, you, you just can't relax. The only thing that's going to relax you when you're in a slump, a couple base hits, then you can go back to the bas basics of trying to relax everything. Bell trying to get it back offensively, and Dennis Cook trying to get something back against right-hand batters. He's pretty effective against right-hand hitters his first couple of years with the New York Mets. This year, though, it's been a different story. The righties have hit over 350 against him. That's one of the reasons why it has been a struggle over the last little while for Dennis Cook. That's a strike one and one. Dennis has never been one of those left-hand relievers who is used in specialized situations only to get left-hand batters out. He's been able to get the righties out over the course of his career. This year, though, it's been different. Just misses outside there. Two balls, one strike on Arias. Left-handers batting 273, right-handers 355. As you mentioned, Dennis Cook is usually brought in the ball game in a crucial spot to get a left-hander out. But he throws hard enough where he shouldn't have that much trouble with right-handers. He can throw that ball by a right-hander. Two and one to Arians. That's a strike at the knee. Perfect pitch by Cook. Knee high on the outside corner. Two and two on Alex Arias. Nothing out of three in this game. Phillies will then hit for Kurt Schilling. Kevin Sefcik is out on deck now. And the 2 2. Foul straight back. Dennis Cook has wondered too about his role here. The way things have evolved. Last night's a pretty good example. You know, John Franco with the Mets protecting the lead very often will work in the eighth inning. And John last night faced right-handed hitters, and then Benitez the ninth to try and save it. But Cook gets Arias, and he's got his first strikeout. Two men away. Well, you look back to the offseason, and even during the early stages of spring training, all you heard about was Dennis Cook was not going to be with the Mets. But right there, getting Arias to swing over that pitch. Good pitch from Dennis Cook. Ball dropping out of the strike zone. Dennis proclaimed himself at the start of spring training, the pitcher most likely to be traded by opening day. It turned out that of the left-handers the Mets had in camp, Jesse Orozco was the one who went in a trade for Joe McEwing. Orozco to the St. Louis Cardinals. So Sefcik bats for Schilling. He'll check the swing at first. No swing, according to Kerwin Danley. A Butch Husky look-alike, mm -hmm. isn't he? Now the Minnesota Twins. 1 0 on Sefsik. That's a strike. One ball, one strike. Sefsik started in right field last time. In 
place of the punished or disciplined Bobby Abreu. They're mad at Abreu. Something is not being said. We're getting some of it. But the Phillies are very upset with Bobby Abreu. A look like something about Sammy Sosa. <laughs> something there, I think so. Foul the way, two and two. I wonder though, I just wonder, Fran, I'm sorry. Would Terry Francona have sat Abreu against two right-handed pitchers? Well, I mean, it's hypothetical. Well, the only guy who can answer that is Francona. Plus the other thing, and he's saying, no, but it's strictly disciplinary. Plus, if, if, if Abreu's hitting 360, you see. Roll to Alfonso. Knows the answer. The other side is retired. <laughs> So, so forget discipline. That's right. <laughs> that batting average can take away a lot of discipline. Mets down a couple as we go to the last of the eighth inning at Shea Stadium. They had a three to nothing lead. The Phillies have come back to score five. Kurt Schilling leaves. And the new pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies will be Chris Brock. Who faced two hitters last night. Zeal and Peyton retired them both. That coming in the ninth inning. So Chris Brock. We'll face Derek Bell, Edgardo Alfonso, and Mike Piazza here in the eighth inning. Brock started this season as a starter. Struggled in three starts, actually four starts. He went 0-3, and then he went to the bullpen when Kurt Schilling came off the disabled list. So once again, Brock picking up Schilling. Bell nothing out of three. Takes low, 1-0. Oh. Eric struck out in the first, grounded out in the third, flied out in the fifth. Bell now 11 out of his last 86. He says it's not a slump. Numbers suggest otherwise. Low, 2-0. and oh. I guess you want to go with that positive reinforcement. The problem is when you go from about 340 to 284, it's tough to find positive reinforcement. It all started when the Mets went west to face the Padres. 2-0 on the way. Takes a fastball for a strike. Remember, he had the game-winning hit the last game of that homestand when they beat the Arizona Diamondbacks here at Shea Stadium. Then the Mets went to San Diego. Bell's bats didn't seem to go with them. Three and one now to Derek Bell. Mahomes loosening up. Bell trying to get on and get the tying run to the plate here. Mahomes getting loose. Brock deals three and one. Up the middle, base hit. And the Mets will bring the tying run to the plate. And they go right to the meat of the order again. Alfonso, he'll be followed by Piazza. Alfonso walk and then twice fly to center. We'll think along with that fan. With one big blow here, and the Mets can tie it. Fonzie has a dozen home runs. So Bell the runner at first. That's a strike, nothing and one. Behind Alfonso, of course, Mike Piazza, and then Robin Ventura. So the Mets have the big boys up here in the eighth inning. It was the Phillies who provided the late inning dramatics. Now it's the Mets who are looking for payback. Each of those pitchers worked last night, Holzimer and Golds. Holzimer faced just one batter. One and one to Alfonso. On the outside corner. So one and two on Fonzi. And Fonzi tonight and last night doesn't seem to have that real pop in his bat. Of course, that can happen to a hitter. For a number of reasons, you can lose the speed of the bat. Although he had it right there. Chris Brock was the winning pitcher as it turned out in last night's game. 
as well as the game on Monday night in Philadelphia against Atlanta. You see the double barrel action in the Mets bullpen. There are times a player will come to the ballpark and just be lethargic. Just if the bat's not quick, the body doesn't feel that good, and there's no reason for it. 162 game yeah. season. That's a big reason for it, right? Well, sometimes you get a good night's sleep, you feel rested, you get to the park, and all of a sudden, nothing is quick. And the one-two fouled away. So Fonzie trying to have one of his typical at bats here. Foul off the tough pitches, make Brock throw him something he can do some damage with, or even work out a walk. And I don't think any Met, even though statistically, we've shown you at one point this season where Todd Zeal will see more pitches on average per at bat than any other Met. I don't think any Met can fight back from being behind in the count as well as Alfonso can. One and two here, and ball two after a couple of foul balls. And that's not only about, say, drawing walks when you're behind in the count. It's about getting your pitch to hit, fouling off the tough pitches, and then forcing the pitcher to come in with something that you can crush. And Alfonso has done that as well, perhaps, as any Met who's ever been in a Met uniform. Two two, ball three. A perfect example here. fonzie has got a chance of, if he doesn't get hurt, going down as one of the greatest players the Mets ever signed as an amateur player and evolved into a terrific major league player. Of course, they picked up Mike Piazza in a huge trade. Bringing Piazza to New York from the Marlins. Crowd standing for what will be a payoff pitch to Alfonso. Mets trailing by two. Of course, the attention paid to Derek Bell. But I don't know, do you send them here? I mean, if you get a strikeout throw, no, then no. Piazza can't that's tie right. the game. You've got to keep Bell right. in first base. That's right. You want Piazza also to swing it back. He's running. And Alfonso fouls it back, and that's Bobby Valentine guessing that Alfonso is going to put the ball in play. Alfonso's a contact hitter, but uh, and I, I like a running game. You see Fonzi batting 438 with a 3-2 and two count. I like a running game, but you've got the big pop around deck that can tie the ball game up with one swing of the bat. So you know what? Bobby Valentine not so much guessing as he is simply relying on the body of work by Alfonso. Again, Bell runs, and Alfonso protecting the outside part of the plate, although that's a pitch I think Fonzi thinks he should have driven and done something with well, other than just wasted. The one uh, area of the plate that Fonzi's handled in an excellent fashion since he came into the major leagues is from the middle of the plate out. Now here's the pitch out of the way. That's a pretty good pitcher's pitch. That's staying alive. He didn't look like he reacted as though he were happy just to be staying alive. Yeah, though, well, sometimes you gotta give the pitcher some credit. Here's that score. They need two to tie. Again, Bell leads from first. He's on the way. High drive face hit. Get up with it. Whoa. Bell to third. Can't have a slide to hold on to the ball. But he made a good recovery to keep Alfonso at first. But again, Alfonso behind in the count, worked it full, got a pitch he could handle. He's done that better than anybody on this ball club. He showed you hitting well over 400 with three two situations. So he delivers here, and now Piazza will represent the go-ahead run. And Galen Sisko on his way out to the mound. Here it is again. Alfonso three and two. What helped him was he fouled off a nasty pitcher's pitch, and the next pitch he got something he could handle. He hit a ball hard in left center field. And got to tip your hat again, cutting that ball off. And Bell had a hold down at third base and Fonzie on first. So Galen Sisko out to talk to Brock. But Fonzie, once again, if you go back to the second last pitch in the count, it was a nasty pitcher's pitch. Alfonso fouled the ball off. And then the next pitch, he got a pitch he could drive, and he took advantage of it. So a huge at bat by Alfonso. Now he's representing the tying run at first base. However, the guy coming into the batter's box simply deliver with one swing of the bat enough to put the Mets in front. Well, he's hit one tonight already. He hit a Piazza-like shot into the green seats. The mezzanine here at Shea, right down the left field line. So now he bats with runners on the corners and nobody out. 
Phillies will play the infield back, of course, and hope to get a ground ball to turn a double play. They don't care about Bell's run. It's Alfonso's. And, of course, Piazza's, and it's ball one. Piazza getting his first look at Chris Brock. Galen Sisko went out to try and settle him down. That's behind Piazza. Ventura, a left-hand hitter. So Holzema might get one of those one batter assignments, depending on what Piazza does here. Ball one off. Mm. Ball two. Well, when you see Piazza at the plate, you almost come to expect that. His home run swing, and he hit it a long way in the first inning. Home run number 20 of the year for Piazza. Two and nothing. Ooh, fouled away. Mike put a good swing on that pitch, just fouled the ball back. And he certainly is awesome when he steps into that batter's box. Outfield very deep and straight away against Piazza. The 2 1 pitch. So the count even now, 2 and 2. Brock did a good job of changing speeds and Piazza out in front. also is so effective at the outside part of the plate that he too can fight back from deep holes. 0-1, 0-2, 1-2, and get a pitch that he can drive. It'll be a 2-2 pitch. Ooh. Just missed inside. Well, you got three and two at the out. Alfonso on first. Bell on third. Here's the 2 2 pitch. Boy, oh boy. We might get a break. I think so. Well, now we'll see about Alfonso at first. Will he run with Bell at third? Fonzie goes. So does Piazza. No throw to second. Piazza down on strike. So Alfonso getting into second base. Significant in that it oh, the tying run of the scoring Number position, four. even though Piazza Rotter has Ventura. struck out. They might walk the tour right here and try to pitch the zeal with the bases low. Here comes Terry Francona out of the dugout. You see the swing by Mike Piazza. Nice play by Liebenthal to scoop that ball. And prudently, he didn't throw to second base. You want to talk about having no rhythm. When you go down and catch a ball like this, you come out and there's no rhythm. You've got no rhythm. You might as well hold the ball. Fonzie steals second base, so the Mets have runners on second and third. Well, they're going to bring lefty in in to pitch to Ventura. So Brock allows a couple of singles, one to Bell, one to Alfonso. He strikes out Piazza, but the Mets have the tying runs in scoring position with one out. We started at 6.30 with Geico Mets on deck, and the Mets and Phillies at 7. So the move made by Terry Francona, simply a lefty-lefty move, and these two saw each other last night. The only batter that Mark Holzimmer faced was Robin Ventura. That was in the ninth inning. And he popped Ventura up, I believe, on the first pitch. And what would turn out to be the only pitch thrown by Holzimmer. Second and third, one out. And this time, Ventura looks at a pitch, and it's outside for a ball. Robin 0 for 3 in this game. Doug Glanville went right to the wall, right center field. All in a fly ball in the sixth inning for Ventura. So Bell's at third. Good speed. Ventura trying to hold the swing, could not. It's one and one. But the more important base runner right now is the man at second base because Edgardo Alfonso 
is not a fast runner. Average speed at best represents the tying run. And the one one outside ball two. We talked about last night's at bat. And you can learn from your at bats that Ventura's the type of guy that will. See the breaking ball and he pops it up. Right now, it's a two and one count on Ventura. Hit hard, base hit right field. The Mets are going to tie the ball game. In comes Bell. Here comes Alfonso. Ventura delivers against the left hander. Five to five, the score. Well, Robin Ventura, who made an error in his ball game, redeems himself. Picking up a big base hit, driving in two runs. Remember the pitch last night? It was out over the plate. It was a breaking ball. Well, he gets a similar pitch, and he hammers the ball. Good swing by Ventura. Extends the arms, pulls the ball in the right field, and he really hit this ball hard. And it was a similar pitch to last night. He showed you the ball that he hit last night. He popped it up to Roland. Pat Burrow was unhappy. He didn't come up with that line drive, but a big blow off the bat of Robin Ventura, and his baby's all tied at five. So Ventura extends his hitting streak now to eight games. 46 RBIs for Robin. Remember, he made that throwing error in the third inning, which led to a couple of runs, but is just a tone for that. So Wayne Gomes comes in from the bullpen. Now the score is tied. Seal will face Wayne Gomes. The Mets have tied the score here in the eighth inning. Ventura at first with one out. Gomes becomes the fourth Philadelphia pitcher. So you've seen right here in the eighth inning what good hitters can do. You saw the numbers on Edgardo Alfonso and how effective he is when he gets to a full count. And he's so adept at working the count deep even after falling behind. So he was behind one and two, worked it full. 438 hitter on three and two, and he came up with a big base hit. And Robin Ventura, who saw a hole of her last night, made an adjustment, and that adjustment produced two runs. So that's how we're all even at five up here in the eighth inning. Robin Ventura has to get a big jump off first base to score in a double. Yeah. One and one now to Zeal. Well documented the problems that Ventura has had with that knee that he severely damaged a few years back as a member of the White Sox. He doesn't really have that great foot speed. I'm sure Bobby Valentine reluctant to pinch one for him. You don't want to take his glove or his bat out of the lineup. And yet there have been a couple of times this year when Bobby has double switched Ventura out of games and you know with nine or so outs to go sixth inning yeah. seventh inning. It's a tough decision because it's it's tough to move a guy out of that lineup with six gold gloves and as he has uh, he's been a run producer with the bat as you look at Gomes' numbers. I don't I don't like the double switch. And you like to keep a guy in the lineup like a Ventura. Three and one now to Zeal. Well, Bobby Valentine has used that double switch sometimes this year. He's ended up with a the guy that he put in the lineup in the double switch in a key spot late in the game, and the guy would come through with the bat. 3 1 pitch, and Zeal bounces one to the whole base hit. Then turn it a second. And the go ahead run is in scoring position with one out. Mm. So Zeal continues his hot hitting, batting over 300 Number with 44. the 11 home runs. JP. And now it's up to Jay Payton. He's got Jason Tyner on deck. But Peyton is swinging a good bat. He's got his average up now to 283. He's got six home runs and 21 RBI. Just see what he did tonight. He's got that double. Hit the ball hard in the left field. And he can fly. Franco and Benitez have been throwing at times during this eighth inning. Jay Peyton takes a strike from Gomes. Like Jay Payton just took that pitch. He looks very comfortable at the plate. Swinging 
to bat and sometimes taking a pitch. You can see a, a hitter has all the confidence in the world. He waits well on the ball. He had a single off of Gomes in last night's game. Behind on the count now, 0-2. The base hit came leading off the seventh inning. Peyton told me one thing that helped him during his severe injury seasons was watching his roommate from Georgia Tech, Nomar Garcia Parra, and his buddy Jason Veritek doing well in a higher classification. He said that helped him as far as his confidence is concerned. And he has it now. Behind in the count, 0-2. Ball sets up away. Gomes throws it in the dirt. The ball and two strikes. And now Lieberthal wants to go out and talk to Gomes. Piazza struck out here in the eighth inning. But remember, Bobby Valentine sent Edgardo Alfonso. And that's no small play here. Even though Piazza struck out, that at that still somewhat pivotal because even though Piazza struck out by Bobby running Alfonso, Alfonso was able to get down to second base and score on the base hit by Ventura. Bobby, one of the more aggressive managers in the, in the National League. One of the few managers that have put the hit and run on with the pitcher. Peyton behind in the count, one and two. Alfonso has delivered. Now Peyton trying to do the same. Now the way. See how Lieberthal went way inside. Gomes almost threw it on the outside corner. This is not trickery. This is I just missed the target. They try to bust Peyton in and Peyton stays alive. Remember now Alfonso stayed alive on a pitcher's pitch out over the plate and the next pitch he got he was able to drill. One oh. two and Peyton tips it and it's held by Lieberthal for strike three. So now it's up to the rookie. The left Can they leader. call up about Number a week 11. and a half, two weeks, Jason three weeks? Here. Here's Jay Payton. Another rookie swinging at a ball that dropped out of the strike zone. So it's up to Jason Tyner. Well, Tyner is hitless tonight. He has delivered a run on a ground ball out in the second inning. So Jason in his 10th start as a Met in position here to deliver what would be his biggest hit. Robin Ventura at second. Zeal at first. No speed on either base. Philly shallow in the outfield. But between Tyner's lack of power and the lack of speed aboard for the Mets, the Phillies are really able to tighten up in left field with Gant and in center field with Glanville to get themselves in position to cut down Ventura on a base hit to the outfield. No one open. Ball, one strike. Tyner got a piece of it. Tyner told me within a few days he saw a great curveball, Mike Messina. Very good fastball, Roger Clemens. And the next one, the slider, David Cohn. He said, now I'm ready. Part of the education. One and one. And he lays off. He's ready to pull the trigger. But now two balls and one strike. Bobby Valentine with the pitcher due up next as Lenny Harris in the on-deck circle as a potential pinch hitter. Do want the tighter. Splitter for Gomes yeah. in a 2-2 count. Ball falling right out of the strike zone. You start your swing, you see that ball dipping. You can't dip far enough. Balls, two strikes, two outs. Lieberthal wants it away. Tyner hits it slowly. They're going to have to hurry. Arias just does get him. A good play by Arias. He got rid of that ball quickly and got it by a half step. But the Mets tie the ball game. Robin Ventura with a two-run single. The big blow here in the eighth inning. And we'll go to the ninth. All even. Five to five. They hit the same group before the ball game. See him on the road a lot? Yeah. Out to lunch. John Franco will come on in this tie game to start the ninth inning. So he'll face right-hand hitters just as he did last night when he worked the eighth inning. We've got three right-hand hitters in succession. This time it'll be Glanville, Gant, and Roland in this 5-5 five to five game. Last night Franco faced Roland, Lieberthal, and Jordan in the eighth inning and got them 1-2-3. Low for a ball. 
two and nothing to Glanville. Doug nothing out of four, although he did score a run in the third inning, driven in by Lieberthal. Ball three. Oh, Johnny behind three and nothing here to a dangerous base runner should he reach. Can't with three hits waiting on deck. That's a strike three and one. Neither starting pitcher factors into the decision now. Ryder went six and a third for the Mets, gave up five runs. Schilling went seven for the Phillies, gave up three runs. That's a strike on the outside corner, three and two. Two runs the Mets scored in the eighth inning, charged to the account of Chris Brock. So Franco fell behind 3 and 0. Now it's a full count to Glanville. Slowly hit. Alfonso's going to have to hurry. He can't come up with it. A tough play. The only chance he had was that yeah. bare hand pickup, but now Glanville is aboard with nobody out. And with the bare hand pickup, it's a lot easier if the ball's not hit well, that hard. Really that ball had some game. movement on it. It wasn't smoke, but Alfonso tried to bare hand the ball that ordinarily you'd pick up with that glove. But he only had one chance, and that's to barehand it and flip the first and finds he couldn't do it. So Glanville, who can run and really has to try to steal second base here, is on first base. And we'll take a look at that ball again. Fonzie coming up with the head, the ball staying down. So Glanville on first base with very, very good speed. Well, here's a guy who's got three hits tonight. They have got a guy, as you mentioned, with great speed at first. You want to give Glanville an opportunity yeah. to run. If you're Ron Gant, you're swinging the bat as well as you're swinging it. Is it a distraction yeah, to have to take a pitch or two and give Glanville a chance? Talked earlier in the ball game. Gant is a guy who's going to be more comfortable against lighter because he throws hard stuff. He's not going to be that comfortable against Franco. Franco dropping that ball off the table by an off-speed pitch. Now Glanville, we, it's been documented that Mets have struggled throwing runners out at second base. They really truly have to put Glanville in motion. Make Mike Piazza throw him out at second base. Gantz hit well tonight. He's hit Franco well. You certainly would not expect the bunt here, but you do have to be aware of the possibility. He squares and just gets a piece of it. I'm surprised at that. Well, Too many things working against it here. Well, the thing again is that we're, you know, we're talking about different pitches. Lighter with hard stuff. John Franco doesn't throw hard. They're going to have a conversation. Now, Vukovic going down and talk to Gant. And he wants to tell him exactly what Terry Francona wants. But I would tend, the way Gant is hitting the ball now, he's got 24 RBIs. Phillies tell me he's starting to get hot. He's taking better swings. As you mentioned, he's having a big night tonight. Tough to take that bat out of his hands. I'd rather have Glanville try to steal second base than try to punt him over with Gant. Then give Gant a shot at getting him home. So I forget the odds. might throw him out. But we're just looking at it from Terry yeah. Francona's standpoint. Yeah, you gotta, you, you really and truly have to put him in motion. Of course, then the wheels continue to spin, depending on what Gant does. If you get Glanville to second, now you're right back where you were last night with first base open and rolling, and then Lieberthal. So 0 and 1 to Gant, who bunted the first pitch now. He's bunting again, but this time he pulls the bat back. So one ball, one strike. Got Zeal going over to talk to John Franco as you see Gantz studying the signs from John Vukovic. One thing you have to be careful of right now when you're calling a game is you don't want to call a pitch according to the bunt. You want to make sure you're asking for John Franco's out pitch because they might take that bunt off right now. The theory is the fastball, the high fastball is the toughest pitch to bunt. It's also one that Gant can jerk over the wall. Start to pitch from the corners. And the change swung on and missed one and two. So Ventura was coming a little bit harder down the line from third. Zeal was angling from first. Francona took the butt off. And Gant was out in front. Now Franco has the advantage. One and two. Really 
it needs a triple to get to the cycle, something Philly hasn't done since Jeffries did it five years ago. Right now, they're concerned with getting Glanville at least to second base. One ball, two strikes, nobody out. And we'll try to peer around Zeal. And Franco sends him a message. No one is throwing for the Mets, which means that the left-handed Franco will be the guy to worry about Roland and Lieberthal behind Gant. Benitez pitched an inning in two-thirds last night. So it'll be a one-two from Franco. No. Well, I think you just increase your value to a ball club. When you have the speed of a Glanville, as you look at Scott Roland on deck, and Glanville's on first base, but you increase your value if you can get on and steal important bases. This would be an important base. Two and two to Gant with nobody out. And more attention paid to Glanville. Big bats up next, one of whom, of course, could conceivably be walked intentionally. All, of course, depending upon whether Glanville gets down there. Franco, two and two to Gant. Glanville not running, and the pitch fouled back. Each team with five runs and ten hits. The Mets have made the only error of the game. That was by Ventura in the third the two runs, although Ventura made up for it with a two-run hit of his own, which has us even at five as we play the ninth inning. And even in all categories. Again, Glanville leads from first. Now Gant calls time. Glanville has not run yet. Remember, Gant tried to butt a couple of times. Took one after fouling one off. And swung through a changeup. So now it's two and two. And again, that's looking to save every possible step. This is not as much designed to pick Glanville off as it is to keep him as close as possible and perhaps catch him leading if, in fact, he is going to run. Well, it doesn't seem like Glanville right now has the aggressiveness to pursue second base. And John Franco, by his throws to first base, has taken away that aggressiveness. Two two pitch line to left field. Tyner over won't reach it. Glanville around second. He's on his way to third. The throw comes into third as Gant goes to second with a double. And the Phillies have runners at second and third with nobody out. And the horn of their batting order coming up. Well, last night, the third base Bobby Valentine elected Scott to Rowland. pitch to Rowland. You wonder, will he load these bases up, or will he once again by walking Rowland, or will he once again? Pitch to Rowland, and the next, and if he gets Rowland, walk Lieberthal. A lot of decisions for Bobby Valentine. Armando Benitez was warming up in the bullpen. Well, it looks like they're going to not only pitch to Rowland, but get Benitez ready. For two nights in a row going after Rowland, who has 13 home runs and 35 RBIs, but it's either Rowland or Lieberthal. You know, I'm surprised here. I mean, if it's a pitch around, remember, John throws that change up in the dirt. He got the chance for a wild pitch. In my opinion, if you're content to put him on, just put him on. Don't waste pitches. Don't risk the wild pitch that brings the go-ahead no, run home. I don't think they're going to tell him to pitch around him. I don't think they're going to tell him to pitch carefully. Uh, they don't want to give him a good... Yes! Now, see, that's his bread and butter pitch. He's not pitching around. John Franco throws that ball out and strikes on a lot. Rowan chasing that pitch. I mean, this is a move for Bobby Valentine. He did it last night. He's got the infield in. He's going to pitch to Roland with runners on second and third. And I believe if they get Roland this time, he'll walk leaving. One ball, one strike. 
Does he hold back? Yes, according to Kerwin Danley. It's two and one. So Franco has gone away with three straight pitches. And he's making, Bobby's making a decision right now. Do you want to, do you want John Franco to pitch to Roland or do you want him to pitch to Lieberthal? Lieberthal's hotter than Roland right now. And did he check his swing right there? Well, Bobby Valentine didn't think he did. Roland's more of a free swinger, more aggressive at the plate than Lieberthal, and would tend to maybe chase that bad change up out of the strike zone quicker than Lieberthal. Yes, he did. He went that time. So now it's two and two. Well, Roland's not happy with the call. Let's see, he might have gone around more. Oh, yeah, he went around. So now it's a two and two count. This is a huge at bat for Roland against John Franklin. So two and two to Roland with nobody out. Glanville at third, Gant at second. Again, they set up a way. And Roland goes down on strikes. Boy, give Franco a lot of credit. Now we'll see if Bobby. Bobby Valentine, once again, he's got Lieberthal at the plate with runners on second and third. But look at this pitch. This is bread and butter pitch. No pitching around, no pitching carefully. He threw his bread and butter pitch, and he got Roland, who's a free swinger, to chase that ball. Well, now to me, I mean, there's Here's no a more disciplined hitter. Now they're going to walk. Good. Well, okay. I mean, to me, there's no... Whoa. Well, remember well, what Bobby well. said about last night with Armando Benitez. But John Franco doesn't have the problem of walking somebody intentionally. No, and it's it's a good idea to bring that point up now because what Bobby Valentine said when he was asked why not walk Lieberthal, I mean, even walking Roland was a consideration, but certainly Lieberthal, Bobby said Armando Benitez is not comfortable so in situations he'll, where he has to throw intentional balls. He'll probably be in the ball game right after this to, to take on Kevin Jordan. Benitez warming up, so he's going to have Franco walk. Lieberthal, the base is loaded. The one good thing about this is you have a force at every base. And Jordan's going to be the hitter. Dave Wallace. The second baseman, number 23. Kevin talking Jordan. to Bobby Valentine as Armando Benitez continues to throw. Mike Piazza is out to the mound. So they probably have told Mike to get Benitez some more time. But it's so hot and humid that take a glass of water and drink it and you're going to be losing. Well, I guess... John Franklin well, in his ball game. Now he didn't start throwing Benitez until rolling. Unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe that Benitez was up until yeah. Gann had doubled. And so Okay, now you're gonna see well Benitez has to be out. Dave Walsh is coming out. They're gonna bring Benitez in. No, he called him back in the dugout. <laughs> well Wallace. Now, here he comes. Oh he called him back in. <laughs> Are these deeks? Well that was two fakes because I fell for the fake. <laughs> One ball, no strikes to Jordan. Terry Francona looking over there, and he's saying you're trying to take me out. Well, he's got a Brayu on the bench, so, you know, he's certainly got a big left-hand bat. He can use it, but he what just up, comes in. What about this? Two balls, no strikes. The only discipline that matters now has nothing to do with Abreu being late for games. It's about John Franco getting something over to Jordan here. Abreu. Not on deck, of course. Matt Burl is. It wouldn't hit for him, you wouldn't think. Brian Hunter, a little bit further down in the order, might be a candidate. But right now, it's Franco, 2-0 to Jordan. Base is loaded. Way inside, almost hit him. And now there's no place for Franco to put him. Well, I don't know if the Mets were not satisfied that Benitez was ready. I don't know whether or not what Wallace was doing I think was, it was Abreu. Team. No, you, you'd rather have Jordan face John Franco than Abreu face Benitez. On the outside corner. Three balls, one strike. The one thing John can't do right now because he's, he's way behind uh, Jordan is he, his bread and butter pitch where he got rolling with that pitch he turns over and runs out of the strikes and he can't do it here because Jordan takes it, it's ball four. Bases loaded, one out, three, one pitch. Hop short right over towards the line. Bell runs out of room. Well, Bell catches that ball. And you're not going to throw Glanville out at home plate. But if you have a chance to catch it, catch it and take your chances throwing Glanville out at home plate. Because you have a three and two count. No guarantee it's going to be a strike. Bell going over. Couldn't get to the ball. It was a few rolls into the seats. I think the only way Bell would have caught that ball was if he felt they wouldn't have to reach into the stands to get it. Got to catch a clear it. Clear shot at third because he was not aggressive. Got to catch it. it. Got to catch it because 
the hitter can pop the ball now and drive in two runs. So it was three and oh, now it's three and two. Most of Shea, or some of it anyway, on their feet, trying to will Franco through it. Nowhere to put him. Five to five. Bases full, one out in the ninth. And on we go. This is a good at bat by Jordan and good pitching by Franco after falling behind. Franco has come back and thrown strike. But again, to reemphasize the fact that John Franco his bread and butter pitches that ball where he turns it over. You've seen it a number of times. It was out of strike zone. He did it against Roland. He can't do it here. Again, the outfield shallow. Randall with great speed at third base. In case there's a medium range fly ball, that's want to give themselves every opportunity. The young fan almost can't bear to watch. Benitez, he's losing the bullpen, but Bobby Valentine knows that he brings in Benitez. You get a good chance you're going to see Bobby Abreu for Jordan. Now, you, I don't believe they'll pinch hit for Pat Burrow, who's got a home run in this game. He had a home run last night. We're going to do the old double switch right now, with Ewing going out the left field. So Benitez will come in the ball game. So John Franco gave up a couple of base hits to start the inning, got himself into trouble, and he struck out Roland. They walked Lieberthal intentionally. And the choice for the Mets was Franco against Jordan or Benitez against probably Abreu. Franco walked in the go-ahead run. The game with the Phillies having taken a 6-5 to five lead as Kevin Jordan was walked by John Franco with the bases loaded. So the bases remain loaded. And the man coming up now touched Benitez last night. Well, he threw him a slider, and Burrow drove it over, over the right field wall. Good hitting by the young rookie with the Phillies, and he hit a home run tonight. If you can hit a slider, even though it's a hanger, with two strikes, well, if Armando Benitez over the right field fence, you just have to tip his cap. Now we'll see if Benita shies away from the slider with Burrow, but he shouldn't. So the bases remain loaded, one out, and Benitez trying to minimize the damage here. Keep it a one-run game. A fastball, nothing in one. Burrow homer to left field off of Al Leiter leading off the sixth inning. Fastball is 90 miles per hour. Side, one ball, one strike. Last night, Benitez was ahead of the count, one and two. Now Gant is the runner at third, Lieberthal at second, and Jordan at first. And the count, one and one to Burrow. Benitez last night, and he pulled the lighter fastball over the left field wall in the sixth inning tonight. He's ahead of the count here, two and one. Well, straight back, and that evens it up. Well, right now, when you see a ball come back, and it came up here by the broadcast booth in a hurry. Burrow had a good swing, just didn't catch up with the heater. This is really, this is the old power against power. Last night, Burrow won the, the battle. Bobby Valentine looks on. They rave about this kid as far as his power is concerned. He's been impressive the last game. Fly ball deep left field. Oh. Joe McEwing to the wall. You believe it. Grand slam. Pat Burrow. And the Phillies take a 10 to 5 lead. What so he is two for two with a couple of homers and five ribbies against Benitez. What a battle between Burrow and Benitez, or should we say it wasn't a battle. He hit the home run last night. You can see why the Phillies love this guy. 
the home run last night off the slider. This time he got the heat. Yeah, hit the ball over the right field wall last night. Hit one over the left field wall tonight. Hit another one over the left center field wall. Can't, you can't hold them down. Armando Benitez is going to scratch his head every time he sees Burrow come to the plate. The slider he got last night, the heater tonight. A five-run ninth inning for the Phillies. And Brian Hunter takes a strike from Benitez. So you wonder about when the managerial wheels start to turn. All a manager wants is the matchup that he deems most suitable. So, you know, Bobby made the choice. Remember with... Look at this. Here's the home run. Bang. Ball out over the middle of the plate. Mention that fastball he threw him first time was 90 miles per hour. Don't have to read on that one, but Burrow was able to catch up with it and hit it out. Popped up by Brian Hunter. Alvin Morris settling under it, two away. You know how you talked about the matchups, and Bobby Valentine had the matchup. He had John Franco pitching to Kevin Jordan. The shortstop, he lost number 26, him, and Alex Arias. What happened is, all you can ask for if you're the manager is the execution. It's up to the player. And Bobby Valentine made some decisions tonight. He brought Armando Benitez in. He figures he gets Pat Burrell after Burrell got him last night. But you got a ball out over the plate. You got to tip your hat to Burrell. Two home runs in this ball game. What a night. Well, those two are better acquainted than Armando Benitez. Had any intentions of getting with Matt Burrell before well, this series began. Well, all I can think of when Armando Benitez looks at Burrell running around those bases tonight, he, it's like that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Who are those guys? Well, who is this guy? Matt Burrell will be remembered by Armando Benitez. And here comes Dave Wallace out to get the big right-hander. So he gave up the grand slam to Pat Burrell. Last night, or tonight, the Grand Slam gave up the home run last night. And the seven home runs now that Armando Benitez has allowed this season, including some big ones. Earl tied the game last night in the ninth inning. And tonight in the ninth inning, Armando Benitez inherited a bases-loaded situation with the go-ahead run already having scored. That's just buying time here for Rodriguez. They've already made the sign to the bullpen. So Benitez got a second chance. <clears throat> that didn't work out either. Last night it was a hanging slider. Some people second guessed the pitch. No. They said, well, why doesn't Benitez just challenge him with his fastball? He's a kid right out of the minors. Well, he threw him a fastball tonight. Look what happened. Burrow hits the ball and down over the plate for a grand salon. Managing stuff is easy. Oh, huh? boy, I'll tell you. So many things run through the minds of a manager in a major league ball game. You don't want Benitez against Abreu. You'd rather have Franco against the weaker hitter, Kevin Jordan. So that doesn't work out. Jordan walks. Now you get Benitez to face a right-hand hitter, Pat Burrell. Boom, four runs. And we're assuming that's the thinking that Bobby didn't want to bring in Benitez to face a break. Well, you know, again, one other thing. Now, Benitez, to my memory, did not start warming up until the third batter in the ninth inning, Scott Rowland, after the first two had reached safely. But he was certainly, or appeared to be ready, two nights in a row. Two nights in a row. That's what this disgruntled fan is pointing out to Benitez, who knows it all too well. Uh -huh. and he needs to be reminded. 1-0 and oh to Alex Arias. Those little deeks that Dave Wallace was throwing before the at bat. Well, they were clearly discussing it because Davis started out, went back, started out, and back. That was before the Jordan at bat. Yeah. John Franco still on the mound. I don't think. I mean, I, I you know what? Until after the game, there's no way to know for sure. I don't think there was indecision there. I think they were just trying to deek Terry Francona. Although I don't quite know what difference it would make because my ball hit by Arias off of Rich Rodriguez to deep left field and pulled down by Joe McEwing for the third out. Either way, if they were going to go and get Benitez, that would have given Francona plenty of time to change his mind. So maybe there were some concerns that Benitez had not been warmed up enough. It's a hot night, although he pitched last night. Field leading 10-5. Pat Burrell 
with a grand slam off of Armando Benitez after John Franco had walked in the go ahead run. So Burl will take the rest of this one in from the bench. And I guess the disciplinary measures used against Bobby Abreu have been terminated by his manager, Terry Francona. Terry's now blaming the cab driver. <laughs> yeah, well, Joe McEwing will face Wayne Gold, takes a strike, and Abreu has entered the ball game. First time this series that Abreu gets in, he takes over in right field. Here's Abreu. Brian Hunter, who was in right field, moves to first. Burl having come out of the ball game. Foul the way. 0-2 oh, to McEwing, who came in as part of a double switch. And Benitez came into the game. So McEwing, followed by Mora and Bell. Here in the Mets, half of the ninth inning. Billy's trying to make it two straight over New York. Four out of five over the Mets this season. And pretty impressive week, too. A little chopper foul when you consider that the Atlanta Braves were in Philadelphia over the weekend. Spilling over into Monday. And the Phillies took three out of four. That would be five out of six against the cream of the crop in the National League East. Alfonso and Ventura had key at bats in the eighth inning, helping pull the Mets even. But the Phillies answered emphatically in the ninth. Nothing in two. And the queuing is gone. First out here in the ninth inning for the Mets. Second strikeout for Wayne Gomes. Number six. You know, Gomes is featuring a pitch drop in the strike zone, and he's getting the Met hitters to start their swing, and the ball is very effective going out of the zone. Melvin Mora, one for four. He's not hit the Mets now, 12 to 10. And if you to us late tonight you might have missed the news that Ray Ordonez is out for the year. Mora drops a bunt down the kicks foul so as of now Steve Phillips explained earlier tonight Melvin Mora and Kurt Abbott will continue as the Mets shortstops at least for the time being the plan is throughout the rest of the year unless something more enticing should come along but at least tonight Steve Phillips said that he doesn't foresee that happening in the near future. Ordonius will have surgery. The doctors were not satisfied that that fracture was healing properly. Warren down on strikes, two men away. So Ordonius will have a plate inserted in that left forearm. The right fielder, number 16. Take a look at that Derek last Bell. pitch to Morris. See the ball drop out of the strike zone. Gomes has featured that since coming into the ball game. It's been very effective. And not penciled in to be a short man out of this bullpen. They figured he'd be more of a setup man, a middle reliever. They've had to make some adjustments because for a while their bullpen has struggled. Well, for the Mets, the bullpen was supposed to have been one of their real strong suits. But in particular, as of late, it has not been. Armando Benitez struggled the last two nights, which is to put it mildly. Ended up key home run last night. Grand slam tonight. And as Bell bounces to Walton, Philadelphia Phillies have made it two straight over the Mets. And Bobby Valentine saw the Mets get off to early leads in each of these first two games, thanks to Mike Piazza. But five in the ninth by the Phillies. And they win it 10 to 5. Goals in that bet. Lights out for the Mets as they lose their second straight here at Shea to Philadelphia. 10-5, the final score. Wayne Gomes, the winner in relief. John Franco suffers the loss. Also in relief, the Phils with 12 hits as they double up the Mets tonight. Our core is light. Play of the game came in that ninth inning. Pat Burrell, the impressive rookie, with the bases loaded, gets a fastball from Armando Benitez and deposits it into the bleachers in left field. His second home run of the night, his third of the series. Not much reaction from Burl, but you know he's happy about what he was able to do tonight. Five runs batted in for Burl. He went two for five, also scored two runs. And the Phils with the victory tonight.